Okay. So we are now live streaming. Um, just want to say a quick good morning to everybody and welcome to our budget sessions. Um, today is Tuesday, April 27th, 2021. Um, I will call this meeting to order. Um, we'll begin today with the roll call, please. Mayor McDougall. Present. Councillor Gordon McDonald. Here. Deputy Mayor McMullen. Here. Councillor Cyril McDonald. Here. Councillor Gillespie. Councillor Eldon McDonald. Here. Councillor Perouche. Here. Councillor Parsons. Present. Councillor Edwards. Here. Councillor Tracy. Here. Councillor Brookschweiger. Here. Councillor O'Quinn. Here. Councillor Green. Here. Thank you kindly. Um, before we get underway, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, and also, um, we are, yeah, this is the first budget for a lot of people. It's, it's, you know, you get your budget binder, it's pretty overwhelming to look at all of these pages, all of these ledger lines, but we have the time and the expertise from our staff to help us through this. Um, what I will say is, you know, we are in the times of COVID. So number one, I want to thank our staff members for all of the time that they have put into preparing our information, our resources, the documentation that we need to get through our budget. On top of that, staff have been working round the clock uh, in response to COVID and trying to make sure that our municipal services and buildings are as safe as possible to the public. Um, I just want to say a humongous uh, thank you to every staff member for everything that you've been doing to provide all of these services, not only to council, but to the public. Um, it does not go unnoticed, that's for sure. Um, also, quickly want to um, go through a couple of things. So in terms of housekeeping, we would like to keep our videos on um, throughout these meetings. We do have the bandwidth to handle that. Um, it just makes for a more personable meeting and also we can see each other's faces. Um, we're in for, we have three days scheduled for budget. Um, should we conclude a little bit earlier as we have in past years, that's great, but really there's no need to rush. Um, I do also want to note, if there is something that does come up and we do have to take a, you know, end early for the day, if something happens in terms of, uh, you know, restrictions coming down from the province in regards to COVID that staff need to come together and, and kind of figure out what to do next, we will conclude our meetings for that day and, and, and begin again the next day. Um, I also would like to kind of release the rules in terms of, of speaking for council members. And I know we've done that before and used two minutes, but two minutes didn't seem to be quite adequate for, for speaking time. So um, if council agrees, I would like to release the rules of our meeting so we can, we can speak um, kind of open-endedly uh, with a five minute limit. Uh, how does that sound to council? Are you in agreement? Agree. 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 Great. Great. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we will uh, just again, in terms of housekeeping, I'm going to do my best to keep uh, the speaking or, or the speakers list uh, manually here. So if we could use the chat function solely for um, speakers list, it gets a little um, trying if there's other comments being put in there. So speakers list or I'm sorry, comment section is only for the speakers list. Um, otherwise, uh, we will hop into things. Before we do, I, I do want to acknowledge that we are in Mi'kmaq, which is the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, uh, and we are all in fact treaty people. So we will now move to item one of our agenda, which er, of our agenda, which is approval of the agenda. Looking for a motion to approve, please. Move it. 
Moved by Kelly Schweiger, seconded by Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. Any discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. All those, please signify by saying aye. 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 Perfect. Contrary, nay. Wonderful. Um, with that, uh, we move to item number two, which is draft capital budget 2021-2022. Uh, we will pass this over to Wayne McDonald, who's our Director of Engineering and Public Works, and also Jennifer Campbell, our Chief Financial Officer. Thank you, uh, Mayor McDougall and Council, welcome. Um, I'm, I guess what I'll do is um, certainly uh, there's been a lot of staff participation in preparing the budget, uh, certainly across the board, and um, there's going to be a lot of staff interaction over the next number of days. Uh, a lot of work with our, between uh, our CFO, Jennifer Campbell, and all remaining staff. Um, if there's questions, I guess that we can try and answer on the fly. Certainly we'll do the best we can as we go through it. If there's requirement for other information to be brought back, we'll get back uh, to council, whatever they require. And um, if I can share my screen, I will uh, start off with a presentation. Uh, there are two components that I, I will go through a presentation that identifies uh, each uh, listing along the capital budget um, and details each line item, but as well in your capital binders uh, starting on page 33 are the detail sheets uh, of the spreadsheets associated with the budget. So there's five years of capital sheets um, in at that point. Um, and they we can go through those after we go through the presentation. And uh, uh, there's additional details on borrowing and uh, the cost share um, allotments and any assumptions and uh, plans that are put forward into future years. So if I could, I will share my screen for the budget presentation. Um, I have to have the host identified. John, is that something you can do? I think Sharon was the host, was she? Do you want me to run the uh, presentation from my screen, Sharon, or is that something you can do? I have a number of items here if you want to pass the host on. There we go. Okay. First thing, first rule is to not have as many screens open as I do. However, I think we have it. Can everyone see my uh, my screen at this point? Yes. Okay, for some reason, I'm not seeing it. There yeah, I don't go. see it. There we go. So okay. Go. And we'll start. Okay, Brent Reason Municipality General Capital 2021. Well, we will be discussing uh, future years. We present a five-year budget with a strong focus on the current year and anticipations for upcoming years for multi-year projects. Um, as a couple of items of note, uh, certainly for council in the capital discussions, as I've mentioned before, but just to reinforce some of those points, municipalities own the core infrastructure assets that are critical to the quality of life of Canadians and the competitiveness of our country. Municipalities own over 60% of the country's infrastructure, but collect just eight cents of every dollar, every tax dollar paid in Canada, with the other 92 cents going to federal, provincial, and territorial governments. So that's a very important point. It comes from the Federation of Municipalities Infrastructure Report Card. There's been a number of those over the last number of years. However, it's a very important point to provide the reasons why we look for um, capital cost sharing and funding from other levels of government. It's essential. We own the majority of the country's infrastructure, but we don't have the tax base to support that. Um, just uh, for in typical numbers and based on generic um, um, 
calculations, eight, approximately 1,800 jobs are generated per $100 million invested in infrastructure. And $160 million of economic growth is generated per $100 million invested. Those numbers can change depending on the projects, but they're, they're kind of a conservative um, um, calculation that's put forward to estimate what the value of infrastructure spending um, can provide for a community. And according to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and uh, I believe the federal government in numerous occasions, infrastructure spending is one of the biggest economic uh, development uh, items that a country can provide. We'll move into um, initially into some of the carryover projects that we have been moving forward with over the past number of years. Sydney Harbor West wastewater collection and treatment um, is the first project on that list. Uh, the project includes an upgrade to the existing collect, uh, sewer collection system and the installation of a new trunk sewer, lift stations, wastewater treatment plant, and new OFA. Um, this is a project that's been ongoing for a number of years. The actual expenditures of, of capital spending started in 2018-19, and um, it's anticipated that the facility will open in two, 2024. Uh, there's going to be uh, three years of significant spending um, this current year. $14.5 million uh, is anticipated for this particular year. The treatment plant and facility is going to be going to tender in the next number of weeks um, and the construction over the next uh, two to three years. Uh, there's a lot of um, work been completed to date, but certainly a lot more to be completed over the next three years. This project has been funded. Um, two-thirds cost funded between the federal, provincial and government and CBRM. So each of these numbers are total numbers. And as we get into the detail sheet, uh, we will provide that for this current year, CBRM's portion of 14 and a half million is $4.833 million. We have the Washbrook Floodwater Intensity Mitigation Project. Um, it was funded under the, um, the Department of uh, the DFA funding through the federal government, um, disaster uh, mitigation funding. We had three projects according uh, associated with a option number 15 that was presented to council a number of years ago. They include a um, retention structure at Mud Lake, a second retention structure at Gilholm Lake, and a third stormwater retention structure referred to as area number five, uh, which was the largest of the three projects. Um, the Gilholm Lake flow structure and Pond 5, which is the, um, which are part of the recommendation for flood uh, reduction number 15, were established through the flood containment and mit intensity mitigation project. Um, interestingly enough, the majority, 96% of the funding comes from Public Safety Canada and uh, another federal uh, portion of 4%. Um, and CBRM uh, does not have to contribute to this project. What has happened is for the past number of years, we've been two years, in fact, we've been looking, um, working with other levels of government on uh, approvals um, for the project and the detailed design. It's anticipated that we will have everything in place this year. Um, the work in around uh, brooks and streams um, are, uh, have to be in accordance with the uh, Department of Environment and as well the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And uh, there's a small window of time frame. So we didn't have the approvals in place last year and we missed the window of opportunity. However, uh, it's anticipated that we'll be uh, completing construction this year on this particular project. Now we move on to the wastewater treatment infrastructure project under ICIP. Um, this had three components. We started the project in 2019-20. It's anticipated to be completed in 2025-26. Um, the project includes the design and construction of two high-risk wastewater treatment systems in Glace Bay and Port Morian communities, the replacement of a battery point UV disinfection system in the Sydney, uh, the battery point treatment system, and that particular project has been completed and the installation of UV disinfection systems at four of our existing uh, wastewater lagoons across CBRM. That project will be completed this, this spring. The federal wastewater system effluent regulations have been enforced since 2012. There's now an immediate need to address high risk wastewater systems, which have a compliance deadline of December 31st, 2020. And that's correct, 2020, so that was last year. 
The deadline is passed. However, CBRM uh, must continue working towards the completion of these systems. And we have been in, been in contact uh, since the projects were approved with the federal and provincial governments. A total estimated pro project cost is $97.9 million, very significant and expected to be completed, completely delivered by March, 2026. Infrastructure Canada and the province of Nova Scotia have agreed um, to fund this project 100%. Um, however, the purchase of land is ineligible. Therefore, there's a few small expenses that we'll be incurring uh, this fiscal year as noted in the table below. However, should the, requ should the project require acquisition of land and or creation of easements, the process will be compliance with the Municipal Government, Government Act. So the significant project, uh, CBRM was um, certainly very successful in, in achieving uh, the cost share uh, of the full entire project. Um, so uh, otherwise, I, I expect that as we get through discussions with uh, the capital budget, we would have been very um, I, I'm not sure if we would have been able to um, construct these projects without cutting a majority of our capital budget out. Uh, so very successful and the projects are moving forward. This year is a $6.7 million year, but you'll see the next two, 2022, 2023, are significant uh, construction years uh, for the project. The, the, the largest spending happens uh, pr primarily when the construction of the plants uh, begin. So that was the carryover projects from previous years. Uh, I will now move into um, our infrastructure, uh, planned infrastructure projects for this particular year. And um, I'm not sure, Mayor, if, if you want me to continue or if we want to stop for any questions. Um, um, well, like I said, we've released the rules of the meeting. So if folks are feeling uh, like you'd like to ask some questions now, I do see uh, the speakers list populating. So we can take a couple questions. We'll start with Councillor Lauren Green, please. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I was just, it's just a quick question. Um, I'm trying to follow this in my binder, Wayne. It is, has this been sent out, what you're presenting now? Because I, I can't follow this. I can't f find this in my binder. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm, I apologize. I sent council initially to page 33 for the spreadsheets, but the project uh, presentation starts on page two. Page two, okay. Page two of the of the binder does not have that for me. I'm not sure about anyone else. Page two of the binder starts off the uh, the presentation, and I believe we were just we had just finished page six. Yeah, page seven, Wayne. Yeah, page six was the wastewater treatment, and we were just about to start uh, local roads. Page seven. What do you have in your binder, Lauren? On page six of mine is the Bayflex ar Arena. Ooh. Mm. I can show you the binder that I have. It's bait. There's what I have. And that's the folder of it. Mm. So unless something changed, I'm not sure about any other counselors, but that's what I'm showing in mine. Are you looking at your new binder or the uh, previous binder that we've received? Uh, I'm looking at my new binder, uh, Capital 2021. Ah, uh, hold on. I have Angela giving me a new one here. Um, okay. <laughs> let's, see, let's see if this is the uh, one. Okay. So I've got like three binders happening here because I have the draft one prior to because I was doing the comparisons. Thanks. And Thanks, Angela. Counselor, you don't want to see my desk. I have about 15 of them here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, just let us know if you need any any support or any help there, Councillor Green. Um, next, we have, oh, sorry, I lost my chat. Uh, sorry, Councillor Cyril McDonald. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, Wayne, I, I had a question pertaining to uh, the proposed local roads and then you stop, but I'll ask it anyway. I'm just wondering what happened to Katrina Drive in Coxheath. It was there. Um, and yeah, was so, uh, Councillor, we, we will cover uh, Katrina under uh, the gravel road section. That's a few pages uh, past. We'll, we'll I, I looked there as well and I didn't see it. So I'll wait till we get there and then I'll ask again if it's not there. Thanks. 
Thank you, Councillor. Next, we have Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. Through you to Wayne. Wayne, just backing up a little bit um, to the Gilholm Lakes project. You're saying that's going to be starting this summer. Uh, I know there's been a lot of discussions and whatnot with the Bear Laird Trail folks in, in regards to that uh, work. Has there been any discussions in regards to the residents along the brook to update? I know the Bear Laird Trail group would be, would be fairly up to date, I would think. Um, has there been other meetings besides that group with any stakeholders besides uh, the Bear Laird Trail Society? Uh, to date, uh, other than the public meetings that had happened a, a while ago, um, there, there have been only more recent discussions with the Baylor Trail Group. I believe we met last week. Um, the, the project got to a point of, uh, or a period of time where we were waiting for approvals and really not much has happened since that point, and that would have been over a year ago. It's almost been two years since the detailed design has been completed and we've been waiting and working with the regulatory bodies. Um, so once we find out that we're moving forward, I, I think we can do some some education, uh, um, generic education out to uh, update on the project. Okay, yeah, no, I was just wondering if that would be the case and with COVID kind of spiking up, it's gonna make it a little more difficult, I guess, as, as possibly time goes by, hopefully we'll knock it down, but uh, I was just curious on how that would happen. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next on our speakers list, we have Councillor Gordon McDonald. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, just for clarity, Wayne, on your roads that are that you're just getting to on page seven, is that Tobin Road? It can't be Tobin Avenue because of Diggins Street, but just for clarity, that, that is Tobin Road, correct? In the north um, of it. I think I have Bruce Hardy on uh, line here as well, and certainly Bruce and his engineering department have been uh, paramount to preparing the list. I'll ask if Bruce can provide some information on that project. Yeah, it's Tobin Road. Thank you. Should I uh, bring the presentation back up, um, Mayor? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, there's no more questions on the speakers or no more folks on the speakers list so we can continue going. I, I'm there, Mayor. I don't know. I must have put okay. it in the wrong spot. I don't know. Oh, do you know what? Yeah, it, it, went under, it went under Darren's. Okay, I apologize for that. If okay. I, Sorry. Just a question, please, if I could. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the uh, wastewater way in the Sydney Harbor West, um, how far does that pick up sewer in that area? Or residents, what areas does that pick up, if I could ask? Yeah, so it's um, it's interesting because the project is is a little larger than it appears. Um, the actual catchment area for uh, Sydney Harbor West starts on um, the east side of Sydney Harbor in uh, in around um, the Sydney River area. Um, there's a section on along Kings Road where where there's the divide where the wastewater in that area moves towards Battery Point. The remainder actually crosses under. Um, Celtic Drive Bridge goes over to the West Mount Coxie and towards the Sidport area. Um, so it's okay. quite a large uh, catchment area. Right. So that's our share is 18.952 million for that? that yes, correct? for the entire project. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Any further questions before we continue on? Okay, seeing none. Floor is all yours again, Wayne. Thank you, Mayor Google. I will bring our presentation back up again and start. I hope this starts. Yes. Okay. Can everyone see my screen again? Okay. Good. So we're uh, moving into the infrastructure section of of the of our budget. Um, the planned infrastructure for this year um, has been has been uh, prepared based on the amount of borrowing certainly um, that we have allotted for this particular year following council's policy and as well opportunities that arise um, coming from gas tax funding and other levels of government uh, where appropriate. And again, um, page 33 has the detail of the spreadsheet that I will go over at the end uh, just to provide council, there's a lot of information on that sheet, but I'll continue through um, the presentation on uh, on each line. So for local roads, 
um, in CBRM, the local streets have been, and we suspect to continue to be CBRM's most pressing need in the foreseeable future as it pertains to road work. We have uh, currently 195 local streets identified for rehabilitation at a cost of 30.6 million. So those streets and roads have been identified through um, deliberations between all of our public works departments and their engineering uh, services who routinely uh, uh, deal with the existing, uh, the existing condition of, of, each, of each roadway. Um, sometimes they change from year to year. Council has provided uh, over the last number of years, uh, the, the basic principle of, of worst first, and we formulate that um, to provide a cost-effective and pragmatic work plan for 2021. Of that $30.6 million, we've allotted $6 million towards uh, the projects that, that we have in the queue. Um, based on our borrowing resolution and available funding, this uh, you'll see with the balanced approach, the budget that we provide, this is um, this is a healthy budget, but certainly not as much as we would uh, we would want to to be able to spend. Um, there there is no direct funding for this, but we are utilizing a gas tax to uh, its maximum availability. Um, this provides, uh, as as identified on the list in front of you, uh, streets in Central Division, East Division, and North Division. Some of these uh, particular street segments are are, are streets that would have only one or two of the sections completed, but they've been all assessed across CBRM as to their condition. And uh, these, these certainly these projects would be projects that are too far gone to, to provide pothole maintenance and to leave it to the operating um, departments to try, and, to try and deal with. And that's unfortunately the situation that we are, we are in. Uh, so uh, we certainly work with uh, the public works crews to determine where their biggest issues are associated with uh, some of these uh, items, whether it be road condition, whether it be some uh, other conditions along the, the, the roadways and uh, put, to, put forward the list as best we can. Um, out of 195 streets that we recommend need to be completed today, we can get 35 completed. So um, it's uh, certainly um, as best we can do uh, with the, the monies allotted. And that is only for the local streets. The next sheet is, is uh, discussing, and the next line item is discussing our collector roads for 2021. And the collector roads for CBRM are really the spine of the community, and they sustain our commercial emergency response, tourist and social activity needs. Um, our transportation network includes major traffic routes, both primary and secondary, designed to carry traffic through our larger urban centers, and includes all of the main arteries of CBRM's transportation infrastructure. The intent of this paving program is to extend the service life of our road assets by employing both pavement preservation and full uh, rebuild construction methods. So in many instances, there has been work done, uh, completed in previous years, and um, we want to preserve that investment um, before the deterioration gets to a point where it starts affecting uh, the base and the sub-base materials. In other instances where we haven't been able to spend money in the last number of years, the roads may be into a condition where they require full rebuild. CBRM has 56 collector roads identified for rehabilitation in our current list of projects. We are operating under worst first in formulating a cost-effective and pragmatic work plan for 2021. The 2021 program will allow for rehabilitation of seven collector roads, and they are identified um, on your screen across CBRM. Wayne, uh, there's a couple questions. Is it okay if, if I, sure. I allow counsel? So first we have Councillor James Edwards. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Wayne, in the uh, East Division uh, roads, I see Alexander Street and East Street. Where is that? Is that in the Waterford or? Alexander Street, Ling to Ocean, and then East Street, St. Joseph to End. Um, I'll ask if Bruce Hardy uh, can identify those. Now both are in the Waterford. They're in the Waterford? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, we have a question from Councillor Darren Brooksweiger. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I guess <clears throat> when we look at the proposed local road list, um, we can see that we are um, really 
uh, down as far as what's needed to um, see a reasonable kind of program. I think there's two and a half uh, streets in the whole district that uh, that I see in that list. And, uh, you know, I've got people calling up, you know, asking to just tear the pavement up and put a gravel. It's easier to ride on, right? So, you know, that's the kind of comments we're getting, you know, from, uh, from some residents. So, you know, I guess I wonder if I could ask uh, uh, Wayne. Um, we were successful last year. Uh, with this proposed collector roads paving, um, you know, with uh, negotiations with MLA and Glace Bay McClellan, they did $8 million worth of roads uh, in that division. And it cleared up money for the rest of CBRM to see that, to see that done. And I'm just wondering if there's, you know, any negotiation on that happening, maybe in the central division and the north side division. Um, maybe a conversation with uh, MLA Mumbercat of a similar kind of uh, program that could help us uh, to cut some of the deficit we got with our infrastructure. It was, uh, it was nice to see that kind of work had done uh, last year without CBRM taxes involved. Um, overall, we all pay into it, but at least it didn't show up in our budget as such. So I'm just wondering, is that something that a conversation uh, could be had if it wasn't already on, on continuing that kind of a, a program to help us out. Thank you, uh, Councillor Brookswagger. Good question. We 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 talked, uh, and, and I think the mayor the mayor had provided her letter um, through to council for what we are referred to as phase two of our proposed piped infrastructure projects under the uh, Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. We provided an application uh, in previous years that included not only the wastewater projects that I presented earlier, but a five-year underground infrastructure um, project. What a lot of the communities uh, did see at the end of those was some nice, nice, uh, certainly some nice rehabilitated streets um, underneath of which uh, we also could, uh, had the opportunity of completing the water mains um, and, uh, and certainly a very successful project uh, I know the discussions as recent as two weeks ago were, were had with uh, the Premier of Nova Scotia and as well the uh, information through the Mayor's office has gone to uh, respected MLAs and Ministers and as well the Premier. I believe we did get a response, Mayor, um, just recently. Um, nothing specific, but uh, I'm not sure if you if you want to sure. hear it. I did send that, that correspondence from the Minister of Municipal Affairs to all of council earlier in the week from Brendan McGuire. Um, so we will be continuing to advocate for that funding for these types of programs. I think it's important to, to identify too, this is not a roads program per se. This is, a, this is an infrastructure program that does result in new surfaces on our roads. So just because, um, you know, it, it, it's just tricky when we're saying, okay, these we're advocating for, hundred cent dollars or however much funding for these roads, it's actually the infrastructure under the roads that needs to be replaced. And that then results. But again, um, just as of a couple of days ago, I had sent that email out or that letter out to all of council. We will continue. It seemed positive in our meeting. I feel for those who were in the meeting, uh, well received. And actually the, the lady who was in charge of finance, I forget her name, my apologies. Um, they had all the information in front of them, so they know what we need and they know how much we need. So we will continue to advocate for that, Councillor. And I thank you, Mayor. And I think the reason I bring that up is, is I read the email in detail that you sent from the minister. And I guess, I guess for me, when he talks about the way he's going to look at all municipalities across the province, I, I guess the only thing I can turn to is our viability report that I chaired, as you know, Madam Mayor, and uh, it really pointed out that our community was in need of help. And uh, and I think that was a paid for study by the province, okay, with their dollars done independently. So I think we have to remind them of that too, Madam Mayor, if we could. And I know you, you're you on top of that. And I appreciate the efforts of the group that went there last week because you put it all on the table. And that's important because we need to have continued or this deficit in our roads of 195 now, and we're only doing 35 is only gonna get worse. So 
thanks for your advocacy on our behalf. Everybody here, we need this and uh, because this isn't gonna cut it, it really isn't. So thank you. No, much appreciated. Hoping, um, well, we were hoping to have the folks from the province come down and meet with council, but unfortunately because of COVID, I don't think that'll happen, but we will continue to set up virtual meetings. We have to have conversations around the charter, around this uh, type of infrastructure funding as well. It, it just, we can't continue status quo, I agree. Uh, next on the speakers list, Councillor Brooksreiter, are you good? Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Okay, great. Uh, next on our speakers list, uh, Councillor Ken Tracy. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, question for Wayne or maybe uh, through Wayne to, uh, to Bruce. Um, just wondering, uh, when we decide worst to first on the roads, are the councillors within the particular districts of the roads, are they included in the process, uh, Wayne? I was off mute. I just turned myself back on. Um, well, I, I guess the the um, the information certainly can be shared with council. Uh, I, I think what we do is um, we try as best we can to identify if there's anything specific that comes up. Uh, I'm sure that when you show numbers like 195 and we can pave or, or rebuild 35 of those, um, it's it's a difficult situation where um but we do uh, advise council but i i believe that happens after council approves the budget so um but we can certainly do that if that's a requirement of council well i just wasn't sure that's all so i'm asking the question thanks very much it's a great question councillor uh did you have anything else you wanted to add in councillor tracy no i'm good thanks mayor Great. Okay, next on our speakers list, we have Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor, and through you to Wayne. Uh, Wayne, I would echo the comments of Councillor Brooksweiger. Um, I think we need to have a sit down with the provincial government and look at some type of a roads program. Uh, as you're aware, Wayne, I called you uh, a week ago in regards to, and maybe you can uh, put a classification here, I guess. Um, I had a call from Minister Mumbercat on what it was referred to as a J-class road, which I recognize as a gravel road. Uh, this was a paved road. So when, it, when, it, when a J-class road that's gravel is paved, uh, is it still classified as a J-class J class road or J-class roads just the graveled roads? No, J-class roads are in the entirety of the provincially owned local road system. What sometimes confuses uh, the situations that an amalgamation or just after amalgamation an agreement was made through some service exchange uh, deliberations that a certain portion of those J-class roads, roads that were a certain age as of 1995, they were approximately 15 years of age. So from 1980 to 1995, roads that were constructed in that time frame that were not paved, there's a requirement that when they are paved, CBRM, um, provides cost sharing. Initially, CBRM did not provide cost sharing for th the first number of years and, and really um, not, not much paving happened on those particular roads, but very early 2000s. And we'll get into that when we get to page eight or nine, where we talk about uh, J-class roads. Um, we did start uh, and we started working on those particular roads, but they're all J. Uh, J class is a provincial classification. Um, if they're if they're currently paved, the requirement uh, for the operation and maintenance and rehabilitation is the provincial responsibility. Okay, and maybe if it could just for the education of the public too. So when you reference in in your in your binder here, uh, 195 uh, roads that are identified for rehabilitation. Exactly what does rehabilitation mean? Is that a full pave or is that a new bed? What does that involve so the public are aware that uh, what happens when we do these projects? Most times on local roads, we don't have the opportunity of dealing with roads that were invested on in, in recent years. Most of them are at the end of life. Um, they require in most instances, uh, some work to the underground infrastructure repairs mostly, uh, some work to um, the storm sewer systems, curbs, gutters, a few of those things, but as well the base and the sub-base materials, the gravels have to be rebuilt. So 
In those in, uh, projects, there's very few of those that are rehabilitation works. Um, they're, they're full rebuilds. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on our speakers list, Councillor Steve Gillespie. Thank you, uh, Mayor McDougall. Uh, when we start talking about uh, 195 roads, um, please remember that we're talking about roads in the old towns and in the old city of Sydney. We're not talking about the, I think I could pretty easily say the hundreds of roads that are in the county of Cape Breton that also need to be repaired. So when we're talking in terms of budget, looking at $6 million spending on roads, we're not spending any of that money in the county of Cape Breton. Is that correct, Wayne? Correct. Okay. So when we're, uh, when Councillor Bookschwager and, and Councillor McDonald are, are discussing getting the province involved in, in helping to pave the roads in the old towns in the city, um, we also have to make sure that we're talking to the province about what their responsibilities are to this amalgamation agreement and what they need to do with the roads in the county first before they come in and start partnering on other ones. We have a tendency here uh, to forget about uh, the County of Cape Breton because it belongs to the province. But in reality, 44% um, of our residents live in the County of Cape Breton. And we have to start looking at what we're prepared to do as a municipality to work with the province on those roads as well as the roads and the infrastructure work that needs to be done in the old towns and city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on our speakers list, Councillor Glenn Perouche. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Wayne, if I could, just it's just a question. When you say the uh, 35 roads and the 56 uh, collector roads, is that necessarily, is every one of them going to get done or could some get bumped? Uh, depending on council's uh, approval today or this week, um, we, our anticipation uh, based on the best information we have is, is for the 35 local streets and I believe seven uh, collector roads and the uh, allotments are there. Typically, if there's a significant issue that comes up, um, sometimes there's things that you cannot see from the, from the surface that we may run into some problems. We've had to in the past uh, only complete portions, but um, all in all, uh, these uh, projects have also been identified as projects that uh, based on all the information we have uh, investigating underground with our services, uh, they, they should be able to be completed this year. Perfect, thank you. Great, I think that is it for questions right now. Uh, Wayne, if you'd like to continue, it's all yours. Thank you. Mayor Google. So that was the collector roads paving. Uh, I know we did have some discussion with regards to the proposed pipe infrastructure projects, ICIP for uh, phase two, what we're calling it um, under the uh, federal provincial cost share program. Um, this is the second year anticipated of the application that we put in uh, two years ago that included wastewater treatment and as well underground infrastructure. And what we typically do on these types of projects is we identify and work with the water utility to provide um, where, where they require infrastructure um, uh, work currently. Uh, this all is formulated with some of the uh, efficiency programs that we have in place and uh, our, our unaccountable water programs that we are working on through uh, the water utility. Um, we have some very old infrastructure underground. Um, a number of, a few years ago, we were, we were told we had an award for a project that was, I believe, 115 years of age. I didn't really feel at that time that was much of an award to have. Uh, we don't really want pro, uh, pipes in the ground that long. Uh, however, um, there's a lot of uh, different criteria that goes into what we select uh, for projects, some of the very oldest of the of the water lines may, in fact, be projects that we don't have too many issues of. But we are trying to uh, deal with the uh, many, many different types of materials, ages of construction, and qualities of construction that we have across all of uh, CBRM. So, 
included in in the underground infrastructure is is one of the projects that's above ground certainly and it's the glazed bay water storage tank uh phase one and the reason i say phase one is we have a phase two that would be in a subsequent year and it's a project the council may remember from a few years ago uh actually a number of years ago where we uh the water utility had put forward a plan to rehabilitate all of our all of our water storage tanks across CBRM. Uh, we were successful at six of those tanks. Um, Glace Bay, unfortunately, had a situation where there was uh, some some issue with the top portion, and uh, and it was in, identified at that time that we will have to replace the the tank. So we're in that time frame now where the tank has to be replaced. Um, and uh, that would be part of these projects. Um, we have been communicating with the provincial government. This is very uh, significant for us. It's $9 million for this particular year. The water utility has uh, their share of, of the projects um, already included in the water utility budget. Um, and so on, on top of the discussions that we've had with provincial governments, uh, we are also preparing uh, based on council approval this week uh, a cash flow of the next uh, seven to eight years that will show all of the projects that we anticipate and how that works with our borrowing um, resolution. The province is certainly very interested in how we borrow and what we borrow. And uh, we have been, uh, that was one of the key pieces of information that we put forward when we provided the original programs um, two years ago. All of these projects have been included in those cash flows to date. They're very important projects because not only do they deal with the underground infrastructure, but as well um, the road the road system. So that then takes these particular roads off of our other respective lists, lists of road work. Um, what I have presented on uh, page nine is uh, would be the phase uh, two projects identified. And then as well on page 10, we have the future 22, 2022 to 2024 projects um, included in those would be phase two of the Glace Bay uh, water uh, tank. And as well, there's a few uh, other pieces of infrastructure, some, some culvert work and stormwater work, as well as, uh, as underground infrastructure with respect to with the road work. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I think there's a question from Councillor Lauren Green. Okay. Should I leave my presentation up just in case the question is attributed to that? Yeah, okay. just leave it up. Wayne, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, for you to Wayne. Wayne, if I could, um, you have uh, Forest Street identified there from Welton to Vulcan Avenue as a uh, water line replacement and road reconstruction. I'm wondering when uh, that road is actually going to be done. Are we gonna be looking at the storm sewer as well there and the wastewater collection? Um, because it just indicates the water line. And, and as you know, I mean, I've had issues with uh, sewage uh, going up in, into people's kitchens because we, you know, they're overflowing. And I'm just wondering if that's gonna be um, addressed when that road is uh, opened. Uh, certainly all of the um, underground infrastructure is investigated when we do any of these types of projects. Um, sometimes there are, we have been quietly, uh, we've certainly presented to council a number of years ago. We've been going across all areas of CBRM identifying if there is any um, stormwater in, uh, actually going into uh, our wastewater systems, and uh, we're continuing with with uh, with that work. That that will come up a little bit later in our presentation. But absolutely, when we do our, our road work, we we investigate and video and inspect all of the infrastructure that's underground, and um, and certainly do what we can to repair and replace. Okay, and on page 10, Wayne, Bay Street, it says um, the box, the box uh, culvert. Can you explain to me what that is? Yeah, so Bay Street, uh, I believe that's in Whitney Pier area. So there would be a, a box culvert section uh, on, on that particular street, it's normally a cross culvert. And um, usually the larger ones are actually, uh, are, are actually of a box shape. Um, so it's been identified through our, our folks um, in the engineering services and as well the public works uh, department that that particular uh, piece of infrastructure is getting close to its end of life. So we have that identified. We do have um, a number of, of stormwater projects that are being added to the list um, as we move forward. 
from a number of years ago, we are doing investigations into all of the uh, watersheds across CBRM and as well all of the culvert infrastructure. And so there's there's a few of those uh, as we move forward. Actually, Bay has, uh, has two separate sections, so there may be two cross culverts there. Okay, and uh, just for, for clarification on box culverts and the viewing public and myself, um, we're talking about um, brooks and streams that are running through our streets and that's the box culvert, is that correct? Yes, so sorry about that. Uh, yes, so in many instances we have, uh, we have water courses, whether they be stormwater ditches, whether it be st small streams, um, right to our very largest of some, uh, when they get much larger than that, they are referred to as br bridges. And uh, we have a number of them across CBRM. And uh, the very largest of those are, are uh, really, there's a few of them, Commercial Street Place Bay, the overpass in, 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 uh, in Sydney, um, but uh, that are owned by the provincial government, but uh, the remaining projects um, across all of our uh, roadways, th those, those cross culverts are owned and uh, maintained by the CBRM. And they are for stormwater only on Santa Rosa. Thank you, Director. Are you good, Councilor Green? Great. Okay, we shall continue. So our next uh, bit of projects go furthering down on, on the, uh, going further down on our infrastructure list. We have the proposed gravel roads paving 2021. So there are a number of CBRM owned uh, gravel roads across, uh, across CBRM. They, they're roads that have been constructed post 1994. Um, to a point in time where our, our service delivery or our, sorry, our subdivision bylaw changed that uh, required all new subdivisions to be paved. Um, there was a period of time where subdivision development had happened in CBRM and the requirement was not to pay. So uh, we are catching up with that. Um, identified for this particular year, 430,000, there's three gravel roads proposed. Um, in CBRM and as well at the bottom of the sheet, uh, there's, there's four other roads that are identified uh, for post 2021. And the, I guess the good news is that we are, uh, we are uh, getting to the end of the list. So there's seven remaining total, uh, three will be completed uh, this year. We did talk previously about J-Class roads, the initial paving. So since the early 2000s, CBRM has entered into a 50-50 cost share agreement with the province of Nova Scotia for initial paving of J-Class roads that reside within CBRM. The CBRM selects and prioritizes the roads to be paved. The road selections based uh, upon consultation with the district councilor on a cycling basis through each district, which incorporates uh, J-Class, which incorporates J-Class roads. Uh, CBRM is currently working from a council approved 2015 phase five list and a 2019 phase six list. Um, the, one of the complications with these types of roads and certainly to the discussion previously, uh, they are not CBRM assets. So borrowing of, of money for CBRM uh, has to be for CBRM assets. So what you find is for J-Class road initial paving, they, the monies are carried in the operational budget and they're, they're um, as we get into operational budget discussions, you'll see that I have uh, J-Class Roads cost share money in the Public Works Administration budget under EPW. So the remaining street on our phase five 2015 list is Gallery Street in District 8. It's anticipated that that project will be completed um, this year the cost here uh, is 50-50 and we have $170,000 $1, identified in the operating budget. Um, now, there's a little bit of complexity with the next slide. These slides were completed last week. Since that point, we did receive uh, information from the provincial government that, um, and I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll divert slightly just to explain how the process works. The, the various municipalities provide a list of what they anticipate they can complete. Um, early in the, in the season, the pro provincial government approves um, projects across all of the municipalities that had applied. And uh, we have received a response back that, um, that the funding is going to be 112,000 from the provincial government, um, which would then be a $225,000 total project and would 
be able to complete Gallery and the first uh, street on this list, Rodina. Typically, what happens is other municipalities may not be able to um, complete their projects. So later on in the season or the year, um, in many instances, the provincial government do come back and offer uh, some additional monies. So uh, if the budget is approved as per uh, present, uh, presentation, we would have um, enough in our share to deal with uh, a few others, Summerhill, Trunk 4, Loop and Sydney River and Marburn Street and Howie Center. Um, but that would, that would be a requirement for the provincial government coming back with additional monies. There's a couple questions, Director. Uh, right. I do have a speakers list here. So Councillor James Edwards, then Councillor Steve Parsons, then Councillor Steve Gillespie. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. Uh, Wayne, if I can take you back to the uh, uh, proposed gravel roads page for 2021, please. Um, the uh, uh, post-2021 uh, uh, paving projects uh, for District 8, Paradise Road and Arbuckle Lane. Did, did uh, those roads change from uh, earlier discussions? Uh, um, wasn't Arbuckle Lane on, on this uh, uh, year's um, roster? Um, I think Arbuckle, Paradise, Barney, Lakeland, all of the projects were on a list of CBRM's uh, gravel roads ownership, but we had only provided each particular year with uh, the plan for the current year and as well, the listing of future years. That's why we identify post 21. So in 20, in next year's budget, for instance, council could approve enough to, uh, to complete all of them, um, or council could approve uh, only enough to do a portion or, or you know, any particular of those, of those streets. So it's always difficult because we don't know what the future will hold with the funding uh, or with the capital budget, but, um, yeah, they, they have been on certainly a road that we have uh, picked away at. And uh, I guess the good thing that, that, that I believe is that between this year and hopefully next year, um, it's anticipated that a majority of these streets, if budgets remain the same, will be able to complete. So is it fair for me to, uh, to uh, tell residents, uh, for example, on our buckle lane that uh, um, next year uh, it'll be done for sure or or uh, is it still uh, a question mark? It would be a question mark until next year's budget, but uh, anticipations would be that we would, uh, if we can continue to allow gravel roads paving next year, um, those particular roads at, uh, at the bottom of the list post 21 would be included. Um, I don't wanna get into too many details, but I'll, I'll certainly get the uh, information from engineering. I'm not sure if they would know off the cuff if all of those four streets could be completed in one particular year with this uh, kind of level of funding. But um, we can certainly look into what the costs are. We would have estimates. Excellent, thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on our speakers list, Councillor Steve Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor, through you to Wayne. Uh, to say I'm disappointed, Wayne, would probably be an understatement in terms of the value of what what, what we're putting in, I understand the matching of dollars, but when you look at J class roads, of course, as, as a big picture, you know, tax rates in the, in, in the rural areas are, are same as a base rate as, as some former towns in, in, in CBRM and uh, with some differences in, in fire services in the rate. But when I look at the total amount of money that we're spending in Sydney, and I get that people can have the roads recapped at $6 million. And there's only 125,000 going into rural roads. And if you look at the total list, District 7 has the most J-class roads of all. Uh, these folks have been driving on potholes for 25 years. And the last, at the pre-budget, I, I suggested that we do an economic review on the total number of roads that we have, uh, what it will cost in terms of how much paving would be required to do them, along with the study would include the number of building lots uh, on all these roads and what the current estimated value of those lots would be. Because at the end of the day, of course, everything's an investment. And I'm, I'm thinking on the lines of if we do that return on investment in terms of collecting taxes, uh, residential taxes on properties that would predominantly be built on these roads and these uh, lots, 
Uh, have we done that exercise, number one? Uh, if not, I would certainly recommend going forward that we, we take on an exercise like that to get a true picture of what it will cost. And then uh, I, I agree with Councillor Gillespie. This has to be a, a discussion with the province because at the end of the day, 47% of our population lives in rural areas and a lot of them are still driving on potholes. And uh, it's just at the end of the day, like this is 2021, I think undertaking that exercise would certainly bring some weight to a discussion with the province that, you know, we finally got to get these things done for these folks. And, you know, unfortunately we all don't live in the city, but uh, at least that conversation could be had. So I, I would suggest that we do that and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Councillor, to your point, uh, we have uh, started the process. It was something that we had completed a number of years ago. So I do have our engineering department putting together some numbers associated with, uh, with what costs could be included. Um, I do have a, a sheet that I'll, I'll discuss later on that talks about the ownership uh, levels of, of streets in CVRM and uh, the ownership of the provincial government outweighs like their, their list of kilometers is significantly higher than what CVRM has. Um, I'm not sure specifically what they have plans for uh, in this particular year. I do know they have a five-year plan that incorporates a number of their projects. Um, but uh, certainly in the past, we have been asked from the provincial government if we wanted to cost share on some of their uh, other levels of roads. We have, uh, we have not um, cost shared. We don't have, certainly don't have available funds. And as I mentioned earlier, we can't borrow for those funds. So the difficulty would be if, if, if council uh, into the, entered into a larger cost sharing program for J-Class, um, we would, first of all, um, have to deal with the operating budget to fund it. And second of all, we would have to have the provincial government agree that their share is going to be uh, approved because uh, as I mentioned earlier, and I think, uh, I'm not sure mayor if this was sent to council, but the list, uh, the response from the Minister of Transportation just came uh, this week, I believe about the gallery and Rodina. No, I can't remember if that was forwarded out. I, I'm, if it wasn't, well, I'll make sure by the end of the day, everybody has it. Are you, are you good, Councillor Parsons? You still have yes, about a minute. Perfect. Uh, next on our speakers list, Councillor Steve Gillespie. Uh, thank you, Mayor McDougall. Um, Wayne, just a couple of questions. Uh, first one is you indicated that there was a change in the funding. Are you suggesting that uh, the funding information that we have here now with $170,000 on each side is now being reduced or is that something I misunderstood? Um, just recently, we ended up getting a response from Department of Transportation um, and Active Transit. It's certainly a new name now. I keep calling it uh, TIR, but it's not TIR anymore. Um, and and just, what, what happens with the funding for J-Class Roads is there's an offer made across all of the municipalities in the province mm -hmm. who have J-Class roads and who have identified that they are interested in funding. That process happens prior to budget. So we just recently uh, received approval for the first two of the roads that we have on our list, which would be Gowrie and Rodina. Mm -hmm. um, that's offered to all of the municipalities across the province. And if there are, is any money left over at the end of that process, uh, we typically get a response back early, late spring, early summer. And in previous years, we've gone back to council to, um, to determine if council is interested in cost sharing for the additional monies um, and expand. One thing that did happen last year is there was a council approval that um, additional monies uh, when received for, for COVID related costs um, could be used to cost share additional roads. And last year, the provincial government had additional monies available yeah, so, I remember that. So I think certainly the first step would be to determine if the provincial government has additional monies available. And um, they'll probably know that. Um, we have to respond within 20 days. So I suspect within the next uh, four to six weeks, the, the province will know if they have additional monies. Okay. So we have an opportunity to do maybe one or two additional roads, as you indicated. Yeah, correct. And the current budget that we have proposed would get us 
based on our best estimations down as far as Marburn Street. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a question maybe directed uh, through you to um, Bruce Hardy. Uh, the Trunk 4 Loop in Sydney River, um, that was started last year in last year's budget. Uh, is the money been allocated to complete it from last year's budget or will that now be completed through this year's budget? Okay, uh, I just got an email from the operations NSTIR yesterday. They're saying they're carrying that project over. So they've carried their money over. Our part of the budget will come out of this, uh, this year's allotment. Okay, and that is the entire part, right? Because I know a portion of it was done. We ran into some issues there. Yes, we yeah. actually had to pen, uh, spend more money on a box culvert. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it, it'll be 100% complete. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor. Um, we can now continue. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. Uh, our next line item on, under infrastructure is proposed sidewalk renewals and replacements, 2021. Um, this is, I believe, year three of a uh, program that the council had put in place uh, two years ago with respect to focusing on sidewalk renewals and replacements across CBRN. These are for existing sidewalks, and they're on roads where uh, we don't have a current plan for the roadway. The roadway may be in better shape uh, than many of our other roads, but uh, the sidewalk infrastructure is in uh, desperate shape. And in some instances, uh, you will see an SS or an ES, that's south side or east side, north side, and uh, west side of various roads. Um, they're identified and uh, it's a million dollars of, of, uh, of funding uh, towards those projects. And it's anticipated that, um, I'm just checking my notes, that uh, these will be funded out of gas tax and I'll get into those details when we get to page 33. The next line is proposed active transportation slash community living. 2021. There was a council motion last year provided with respect to the active transportation program. We typically have $1 million conditional on two thirds cost sharing allotted each year for active transportation. And uh, we typically have a number of projects uh, identified and then in various stages of funding uh, requests. Um, last year, Council's motion was to attribute the entirety of the funds forward to the Hawk Stream Field in Dominion. And uh, with the recent announcements, announcements, that project is moving forward. So what we, have, what we have provided to Council on the sheets are that a specific line associated with Hawk Stream Field is there for 930000 And then as well, there's a, a, a bit of money left over uh, because of how um, how significant the funding was for the Hawk Stream field. And we've identified through, um, uh, with, with respect to active transportation, that there may be some small type of projects uh, with respect to signage, uh, line painting. And when we talk about line painting, we're talking about utilizing uh, permanent line painting techniques. Um, it's a little deceiving. They're not fully permanent, but they do last in multiple years and uh, as well uh, crossing treatments at specific crossing locations. So uh, there would still be some funding requests in and depending on if, if they can be uh, cost shared, we would have about 70,000 towards the community living and the active transportation piece. And then the uh, majority of the project towards the Hawk Stream field. And uh, as noted on the screen, um, the Hawk Stream field will be a fully accessible field where people of all ages and abilities will be able to participate. This will include accessible dugouts and infield where wheelchairs can round the bases, charging docks for mobilized motorized mobility aids and bleachers that will accommodate all fans. In addition to the fully turfed and artificial infield base, baseball field, uh, uh, competition grade, um, bocce ball court, walking track and splash, splash pad will allow all people to enjoy the outdoors and benefits of exercise within view of the Atlantic Ocean and Dominion Beach. Um, so that project is in the early stages. Um, once, uh, and I, I believe um, Director Bill Murphy may be on the line if there's any questions, but uh, they will move forward to detailed design and uh, anticipation for this year um, upon 
council's approval of your budget. That's great, uh, Director. We just have a couple of questions here. Um, Councillor Steve Gillespie had a follow-up followed by Councillor Parsons and then Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. Uh, question to Wayne McDonald. When it comes to the gas tax, my understanding is that we received a doubling of the gas tax this year. Is that correct? We did. Okay. Um, when it comes to how we spend that money and where we spend that money, uh, is it completely up to us on how we distribute those funds? Uh, it's it's certainly up to up to council uh, to approve the budget. The difficulty with gas tax funds is there's a specific criteria for where they can be spent. So we utilize those on projects where we don't typically have funding, and on projects that qualify for their criteria. I know uh, both Jennifer Campbell and myself have been looking and working with the criteria. Um, many of our roads type projects and uh, sidewalk type projects are, are included um, being funded by gas tax. Any mm -hmm. fund, any project that doesn't, that already has current funding can't be stacked with gas tax. Okay. So um, it, it limits where we can spend the money. The anticipation for this year, it's, it's, it's doubled, but it's basically a second allotment. It's not entirely doubled exactly, but um, we have, and when we get to page 33, I'll, I'll, I'll provide that we have $11 million allotted for this year of mm -hmm. a year where we typically be just shy of 7 million. Yes. So our total uh, provides, I believe, two, uh, 2 million and change are, are provided in year two, 2022, okay. 2023. Um, and the reason I ask that question, of course, is, uh, you know, when we go back uh, just quickly and look at roads, um, we're looking at spending approximately uh, $17,600,000 on roads in the old towns in the city and approximately $770,000 on roads in the county of Cape Breton. Um, I think that as uh, Council Parsons had pointed out, when you look at the number of people that live in one versus the other, not only that, but you also have to look at the revenue that is generated my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but just shy of 47% of the residential taxes are collected in the old county of Cape Breton. Yet, um, we're spending 770,000 on roads there and $16.7 million on roads in the towns and the old city. So, you know, there's a discrepancy there that I think we should be addressing in, in future budgets for sure. Um, one of the things that popped up uh, as we had these conversations were sidewalks as well as curb and gutter. And when we talk about curb and gutter and sidewalks, the one thing that was brought up before, and it was uh, Councillor Parsons uh, that indicated this, was, you know, if we can't get, if the county of Cape Breton can't get uh, the provincial government to spend money on roads and the municipality cannot spend that money on their roads, then we should at least have the best sidewalks and curb and gutter in the entire province of Nova Scotia, because at least we could do something with that money. I noticed with the amount of money that is going to be spent on uh, sidewalks this year, there are a few in there, definitely from the province that need or from the county that need to be addressed. But ultimately, I think we should be looking at spending more money in the county on uh, sidewalks. Uh, refurbishing the ones that are currently there that are made of asphalt. And also, I would also like you to look at an email that I will be sending out shortly regarding the curb and gutter uh, issue that we have uh, in my district and in probably other uh, county districts as well. Um, so just some food for thought, Wayne. Thank you so much for your time. Thank Thanks, you. Counselor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on our speakers list, Councillor Steve Parsons. Thank you, Madam Mayor, through you to Wayne. Uh, Wayne, a, a great segue, Councillor uh, uh, Gillespie. Uh, I wanna speak about a road that I think everybody knows of that's in my district, that it's a, it's a main road with a, with a fair amount of feeder roads attached to it. And that's namely Tom and Terry Drive. Uh, Tom and Terry Drive is, is the main road in Howie Center. Uh, it's, it's been equipped with sidewalk uh, halfway up through. Uh, there hasn't done any work as completed on that since, uh, since the initial sidewalk. And I just wanna make a point that hundreds of cars drive on that road every day. 
and hundreds of people, I wouldn't say hundreds of people, probably in the summertime, certainly walk it because there's a school, uh, Mountain View Elementary, uh, that's 240 students uh, equipped in that school. A lot of people walk to school, uh, but of course they got to walk on the main road. And we've had several complaints on that road as it relates to speeders. I've, I've talked to and emailed uh, the chief of police, Walsh, about the area. And, and uh, again, not only there's not proper sidewalks, uh, there, there's also roads in the same general area with potholes into it. So again, it's just a complement of issues uh, in that general area where hundreds and hundreds of people live. And, uh, you know, I just, it never seems to be hitting a list, but, and I get, you know, proposed activity as far as transportation and active living. And now we're going to spend money on ball fields and uh, walk, paved walking trails. And, and we can't get on a main road in, in the rural area where hundreds of people are walking and driving daily, uh, a continuation of sidewalk at curb and gutter. And I, uh, it's hard to explain that to the residents when they keep asking year after year after year. And I think uh, you know, it's time that some of these hit a priority list and we, uh, we put, put some money into it. Thank you. If I could, Councilor Carson, it's, it's uh, certainly a, um, an issue that, that we're hearing across the board. Um, and it's mostly with regards to expansions of services and expansions of sidewalks. Um, I know that through Director Roos, uh, the active transportation folks are moving forward with their new plans. Um, we've identified many um, pieces of, I guess, projects that we would be interested in putting forward in the plan. Determination of when they get funded, we're not certainly sure of, but they would be, um, you know, similar to some of the Blue Route type of uh, projects that happen on provincial highways, um, extensions of, of of, uh, of accessible and um, multi-use paths, whether it be multi-use pathways, sidewalks, other things, sections where we have uh, loops that are not fully connected, uh, specific sections of, of sidewalk uh, uh, expansions where we're reasonable. And um, certainly the difficulty that comes into play is that we have in recent years not been successful at receiving funding for those type of projects. The active transportation project uh, has always been conditional of two thirds funding. And I can look out my window and, and see the Westmount area and think of a number of years ago where we had a very significant project uh, of, I believe, three or four phases where we extended sidewalks and Westmount Road. Very successful, lots of people using it. And I think as we move forward, it sounds like the provincial government is, is certainly uh, putting significant weight into active uh, transportation and, and um, active living and I'm, I'm certainly hopeful that uh, we will have projects uh, approved through funding mechanisms that could allow for those types of uh, infrastructure expansions. Thank you, Director. Uh, anything to add, Councillor? Yeah, just for the matter of record, Madam Mayor, I understand we need to go back and repave and and fix up sidewalks that are existing. But when you don't have an initial sidewalk on a, on a, on a, on a main drive involving thousands of people uh, walking, driving, then it's, it's a hard sell to say to the taxpayer that, you know, we can't continue with your sidewalk, uh, but we're gonna, you know, take some of our monies and put into other areas. And we can't keep saying, we're waiting for the province. We're waiting for the province here. At some point in time, we need to do for our people who live in the rural areas, just as we do in the city. And I, I get all that. But at some point in time, not having the province come aboard, we can't use it as an excuse not to deliver on some of these uh, services. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So we have uh, a good speakers list coming here. I just want, for, for everybody's knowledge, I have Councillor James Edwards next, Councillor Eldon McDonald to follow, Councillor Gordon McDonald, and Councillor Darren Brookschweiger. So we'll start with Councillor James Edwards, please. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. And I'd like to also expand on uh, uh, what Councillors uh, uh, Parsons and uh, Gillespie were saying earlier, but also uh, to uh, uh, Councillor Ken Tracy's uh, point earlier. Uh, I'm uh, referring to the uh, uh, sidewalk selection here. Um, when we talk about uh, the, uh, um, uh, the list and uh, um, if there's any consultation done with any uh, councillors, um, uh, certainly, uh, I have a particular uh, sidewalk on Lake Road in Glace Bay, uh, where I get uh, 
uh, constant complaints about uh, uh, the, the people can't uh, walk on it. Now, I also happen to drive a school bus on Lake Road and Glace Bay. And uh, during the winter, when the uh, when the snow comes, uh, it's plowed onto the uh, sidewalk and uh, forget about it. The street is narrow to begin with. Um, but uh, now we have uh, our kids walking on uh, our streets and the like, and, and plus uh, residents out uh, complaining uh, full time that the, pardon me, that the sidewalk uh, isn't, uh, um, well, certainly adequate or serviceable. So uh, I just like to add my voice to the um, uh, to the chorus that uh, I would like to be uh, consulted uh, when uh, any or, or if any um, uh, construction is going to be uh, carried out in, in at least District 8 because that, uh, that particular sidewalk would definitely uh, uh, be brought forward. Um, and I have another uh, point to make uh, when we get to the um, uh, to the next slide, but I'll, I'll wait for that, uh, Wayne. Thank you. Councillor Edwards, it's a good question. If I could, uh, Madam Mayor, just we do likely have all of those projects on our lists. And, and I think the difficulty is um, the million dollars is, is what we can reasonably throw, uh, throw at these types of projects this particular year. This is only year three of, of uh, the concerted effort to upgrade our, our sidewalks across CBRM. Um, I expect that, you know, we, we do have section uh, areas where we would have the road in very, um, very poor shape, as well as the sidewalk that would likely be on a road re rehabilitation uh, list. These particular um, projects would be outside of the road work, and they would be in areas where the roads are in reasonable condition, and we can go in and deal with the sidewalk alone, and, uh, um, but uh, it's certainly not the not the, the definitive list on all the sidewalks that are being done. Um, and I think the difficulty that comes into play is that uh, in all instances, we, we, we certainly don't have enough money for, for the needs that are out there. Yes, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, in this particular uh, uh, case, uh, there is some road work uh, required, but uh, um, for, for the most part, it's, it's not in, uh, in that bad of shape. Uh, although there is one particular section that is uh, that does require some maintenance, but the sidewalks, especially, uh, I certainly want to uh, bring to your attention, uh, Director. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councillor. Uh, next, we have Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. And through you to Wayne. Wayne, uh, <clears throat> I raise the issue of sidewalks uh, just about every year, uh, and uh, I go to Rotary Drive with the, uh, the missing middle. Uh, and uh, I would like at least maybe for staff to be able to look at that and see what kind of costs would be involved with the sidewalk at the top end and the sidewalk at the bottom end and nothing in the center. I always say it's an incomplete sidewalk. And I know you reference it as a new sidewalk. Um, even if we could have a look at that to see what kind of costs would be involved in it. Um, it's a heavily walked street. Uh, people in motorized wheelchairs in the wintertime, it's terrible. I say it every year. Uh, someone's going to get seriously injured there, I think. There's some, some pretty bad uh, turns uh, that are basically blind turns. And uh, I know, I see it myself with uh, individuals in wheelchairs coming down that street on the roadway. Uh, but uh, maybe we could uh, at least this summer have a look at, 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 at costing something to see at least what it would look like in regards to prices. Uh, so I put that out there. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll reference is, and I think we need to have a sit down, as we said earlier, with the province in regards to roads and construction and how that's done. Uh, who owns what and, and trading roads. Uh, but I think there's another another issue we have to look at, and I don't know if this has been done in the past or not. Maybe you can uh, provide some some information or, or or possibly through you to Bruce. Has there ever been any look at? We talk about uh, how much money is being spent in the rural roads versus the the, the uh, urban roads, uh, and uh, tax dollars that people are paying from property taxes. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when we pull into the pumps, uh, there's provincial tax on your gas. Uh, at the pump and that money from my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong is supposed to be reinvested in roads back to the streets across the province. Has there ever been an exercise to show how much uh, revenue is generated from the pumps here uh, in CBRM versus what comes back to road construction in the rural areas? Do you know if that's ever been looked at? Uh, 
Councillor, I haven't seen it, but I can certainly uh, ask the question. It's a good point. The gas tax that we receive, uh, I believe, is only from the federal portion of gas tax. Um, but there is a provincial portion that that, that certainly does uh, make its way to the provincial government. And as well, certainly all of the provincial taxes paid by everybody in CBRM. Exactly. And, that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that that provincial uh, percentage of tax at the pump 100% is that of that is supposed to be going back into roads. Would that be correct? I, I, I will find out the details. I'll certainly ask the question. Okay. I, I would like for that to be part of that discussion. When we arrange some meetings to have that, I think that needs to be part of the discussion also. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, we have Councillor Gordon McDonald. Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. And uh, I too kind of want to get in on the discussion around the side box and uh, within the county areas. Um, you know, I certainly have a couple areas uh, that are in desperate need of, of side box and you have a situation where, you know, if we had a, it's a bit of kilometer long uh, side box out on Schoolhouse Road, well, Schoolhouse Road would connect the communities of Alder Point and Little Pond and, and, and the Schoolhouse Road and the Ocean View subdivision. And there's a lot of walkers out in that area. And then you got the Tolman Road area where, where you know, it's a it's a main thoroughfare between uh, Sydney Mines and North Sydney and, and the other county areas. Uh, you have the Northside Industrial Park off this road. You have the Haley Street Adult Service Center. And you also have Memorial High School students that are regularly walking this area. And, and the road is deplorable. You can't get the, 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 the DOT to come in and do the work that's required to, to make these uh, roads and, and areas a little better. And, and, and certainly the discussions around sidewalks uh, and within the CBRM are, are, are you know, they're, they kind of don't want you to be having that discussion from, from what I'm getting. But, um, you know, we had uh, uh, Bruce Hardy uh, just on a, um, a, a kind of a detailed report on the costing of a sidewalk in the Tobin Road, Haley Street, Muir Street area, you know, to facilitate, you know, the necessities of, of the two schools, Memorial High School and Haley Street Adult Service Center. And it's a significant cotton in the vicinity of about two and a half million dollars. I mean, you know, so, but we are, if you're looking at active transportation, this area is, is used, you know, in full capacity. There's a huge amount of traffic on, in this area and, uh, you know, curb and gutter and, and I know costs are, are there, but, you know, uh, residents, as you say, they're, they're still paying taxes. And these are the county areas that are paved roads. So they're, you know, it's not, it's, it's more of a, of fixing up the roads and, and having sidewalks put in place. Uh, you know, and then with active transportation, to put a kilometer piece of a sidewalk in around the schoolhouse road, you know, that's, you would have about a, a five, six kilometer active transportation route where you wouldn't have to be walking in the middle of the streets and those kind of things. So, you know, I, I do believe that we should be looking at where the funding for, from uh, the, the municipality is dispersed and how the, that funding from the province is getting dispersed. And, and we need to look at you know, looking at sidewalks and as, as the council person pointed out, you know, we are fixing up ball fields uh, at, at a significant cost. And, uh, you know, I certainly don't, I, I support that stuff, uh, but we need to look at uh, being able to put those dollars towards where the most majority of our residents are going to get serviced by the dollars that we're spending in these kind of activities. So, okay. And that's just what I wanted to add my two cents worth there. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. So next on our, our speakers list, we have Councillor Darren Brookschweiger, followed by Councillor Ken Tracy, then Councillor Steve Gillespie. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, this is the um, pretty well the same way we start, uh, you know, every, every budget session with rural versus uh, urban suburban. And, uh, you know, it's all about the lack of money we have and uh, the funding that's needed to do everything we'd like to see done. Um, you know, I, I think about in Glace Bay Dominion, for example, we've got 83 sidewalks that aren't being plowed right now. Um, some of the reason is, is some of them, it's the condition they're in. Our guys won't go on them with the machines. They're too narrow, they're falling apart. And uh, in order to get a new sidewalk on the list to uh, get plowed as pointed out I had Center Avenue that I brought the council last budget as you'll remember Madam Mayor and uh, 
a few of my colleagues, you know, that had to go to staff for review and everything, but we still got all these sidewalks that people should be uh, walking on that were not able to do all the service. And uh, it was all about money and funding cuts and everything over the years that and active transportation is being more pointed. We're all aware, more important, we're all aware of that. And we all uh, get the calls and the concerns about it. Um, but the funding formula has always been an issue for us. We never ever had enough money and that's why the equalization thing to the funding um, uh, conversation, it's always been an issue and, and it will be until uh, help comes. But, um, you know, when we talk about uh, the rural roads, and, and I hear this quite often. You see, at the service exchange, you know, it was a decision at that time that the province were going to take roads. And we had to pay for education, housing, and corrections. And I think this year it's 17 million, but I think back a few years ago it was the same amount as the equalization money we were getting at 15 million. And, you know, that's, that's 41 cents of our rates in CBRM. So 207 in Dominion, it's 166 that we actually get as a community in CBRM. In the rural area, the dollar 41, you're actually giving CBRM a dollar. We're the middleman collecting that money and sending it back. For me, I'm a firm believer that we could do more. If the province would take back the responsibility for some of this service, we could do more roads throughout CBRM. But in the meantime, as long as we have to put that money towards education, housing, and corrections, and we have a limited budget, how could we possibly take on something that they're responsible for, you know, any more than we're doing now has always been the issue. Um, you know, I hear this story, I, I represent rural residents, and they talk about it just a garbage bag being picked up. Well, there's more than that. Jennifer put up a slide and we see the services on how they're almost balanced as far as cost. I mean, we're spending 18.9 million on sewer treatment. That's mostly picking up the rural area. It's not like we don't spend money, right? But we all got concerns and I understand them, but we don't have enough money to look after what we are presently responsible for, let alone trying to pick up more. And when it comes to sidewalks, we get sued quite often from people tripping on sidewalks. Our insurance company told us you got to fix them, right? Or they're not going to cover us. That's what it's going to come down to. So we got an obligation to fix those sidewalks as they come in. And until we get them to some kind of condition, I don't know how we can expand it. That's the problem we got. And then the other thing, as I pointed out, if you get a sidewalk, maybe you're not going to be able to get it plowed because we don't have the money to service it. So it's, it's a tough balance, Madam Mayor, as you know, and it's, uh, it's all about dollars and, and what we're responsible for and not responsible for. And Eldon touched on it. Every time a resident in the towns and cities go to the gas uh, station or they buy a bottle of pop or a bag of chips, whatever their preference is, a cup of coffee, there's taxes charged on that. And that is supposed to be putting on money for the rural areas as well, the major provincial roads. So I subsidize that along with paying high tax rate in the community of Dominion, along with the residents that I represent. So it's a difficult, and all I'm saying is that we all got needs and we, we're trying to represent our residents the best we can, but to think that we can take from the small amount that we presently have and move it out to something we're not responsible for I, I think we'd have some major issues, Madam Mayor, with that. So I'll stop for now. Your time, yeah. Got another time. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Um, I just received a quick email from uh, from our CAO, and really, at some point during this, these discussions, we do have to have a conversation as well as well regarding the municipal capacity grant. Um, as many people know, uh, this is another avenue for us to to receive funds that we are supposed to be getting to help bring our services and our infrastructure up to a comparable rate to the rest of the country. Um, but yeah, that the provincial government froze that rate back in 2014 and, and promised a formula review, which has yet to happen. So 
throughout the discussions in the next couple of days, I really do hope we can talk about that as well. I know it's not necessarily a budget item, but imagine what it could do to our future budgets if we are successful in getting that formula uh, revisited. Um, thank you, Councillor, for your very thoughtful comments as well. Next, we have Councillor Ken Tracy. Thanks, Mayor. And uh, to Councillor Brooks-Wacker's uh, points, uh, I totally agree uh, with what he's saying there. But I haven't said that, uh, I'm a little confused. I believe uh, to you, Wayne, uh, same as the roads, the sidewalks, worse first. Uh, would that be the scenario with the sidewalks? Yes. Okay, so I look at I look at the East Division and there's no question these, uh, these sidewalks are a priority as well. But uh, over the winter months, I've had some complaints uh, on Douglas Avenue where sidewalks weren't being plowed. And the, re, uh, the answer I get from, uh, from the guys here in town is that basically our snow plows are not big, are too big to fit on the sidewalk. Um, that's a busy, busy part of town, as you know, the hospital's next door. Uh, people use that uh, frequently walking when, uh, when uh, the weather breaks. Um, my question to you is, has this been in, uh, in discussion, uh, Douglas Avenue, in terms of repairs? And, and I know, you know, we're, we're trying to be fair to everybody, but uh, when I go back to uh, the residents of uh, Douglas Avenue, District 9, um, I'd like to have some type of maybe answer for them as to when maybe the possibility uh, this particular area will get, uh, will get looked at. Thank you, uh, Councillor Tracy. Yes, so we definitely have Douglas Avenue on, on our list. Um, it's one of those situations uh, that I think was alluded to um, by previous council comments. It is uh, a section of sidewalk that is, is very narrow and it's adjacent to a, a stormwater ditch. And so uh, public works and engineering have been looking at the area. Uh, sometimes if there's a repair that can be done uh, or completed that can, can solve the, the problem, that may not, that may be the reason why it's on the list or that it's on the list, but just didn't make the cut for this year. So I'll certainly ask staff where it is, but be rest assured, I, I heard about it uh, for the last couple of years. And it's, uh, I know public, both public works and engineering are looking at that area. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you kindly, Councillor. Uh, next, we have Councillor Steve Gillespie, followed by Councillor Eldon McDonald. And I just want to make a note too, I forgot to mention this this morning. We're going to break around 1145 for lunch. I know um, a few of us are going to need to do a little bit of work too in terms of COVID information that's coming through. So we'll break at 1145, just so everybody is aware. Uh, again, Councillor Steve Gillespie, you're up. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor McDougal, and, and uh, really just a point, uh, as uh, Councillor um, Elder McDonald had indicated, uh, you know, gas tax, uh, you know, when, you, when you're pumping your gas, and as Councillor Brooks Rager indicated, you go to the store, you're buying stuff, all that taxes go in. Um, the, 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 the reality is I deal with Department of Transportation virtually every day, and uh, they have made it very clear uh, that their priorities are highways. Uh, and uh, it is a budget concern. Uh, the Department of Transportation locally here in CBRM does a fantastic job with the budget they have. Uh, unfortunately, that budget has virtually never been increased since amalgamation. And uh, you can see it in the services that they provide. So when we talk about issues that we have at Department of Transportation, it's not the local aspect, it's the, it's the province, it's the government itself. And it doesn't matter which government it is. We've seen the flag from the NDP, from the conservatives, from the liberals, it's always the same thing. Uh, we have to talk to them about the increase in, in the budget that they have for the area. And when they consistently say that roads are not a priority for them, they indicate not a priority based on budget. So highways first, um, you know, accessible uh, to the highways, the off ramps and the major roads such as, you know, Kings Road and uh, Grand Lake Road, those things. But when the budget is gone and all the other roads are still in need of repair, they just don't have the money to do it. Uh, and if they don't, although amalgamation did indicate where priorities were going to lie when it came to roads and certain infrastructure, um, 
the council back in 1995, 1996, under its first mayor, did make changes to the taxation. And um, I think we just need to talk about whether the taxes that we currently are charging to all residents are a reflection of the services that they currently or may receive in the future. We're seeing an expansion into the old county. Just about 30% of the people from 1995 lived in the county and now we're at 44.3%. So there are changes coming um, and I'm not indicating that we make changes today. I'm suggesting that any changes we do look at, uh, we look at for future budgets and uh, how our amalgamated area is now being uh, serviced. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, as a Councillor, you and I sat at TIR's tables and seen the dwindling budgets for sure. It's It's been progressively bad. Um, next, we have Councillor Eldon McDonald, please. Thanks very much, uh, Madam Mayor. And uh, I was just going to make a quick comment, I guess, and follow up. And, and I, I agree with uh, a lot of the comments, and in particular, Councillor Brokeswagger's explanation of, of how things have worked and how it challenges us. Uh, but you mentioned about the CAO sending a quick email, which is the reason I, I raised the issue of the tax at the at the pump. Um, you know, it comes back to your fair share. If we're if we're spending money at the pump here, uh, and and I'll just use you know fake numbers. So they collect a million dollars from CBRM at the pump, and they send us back fifty thousand. Well, that's not acceptable. So there needs to be a discussion around that. Um, appreciate the comments from Councillor Gillespie in regards to their focus as the highway. Well, we as councillors always get the complaints that, you know, the roads are falling apart. Um, I, again, I mentioned in an email not long ago where I just received a petition for a provincial road in my district that's falling apart, 100 names on it, and it wasn't even sent or addressed or even mentioned to the MLA that represents the area, but copied to an MLA that, that is in government, which is Minister Mumbercat. And I appreciate that they that they copied him, uh, but in the end of the day, there needs to be a discussion. And if the residents aren't happy in the rural area that the roads are falling apart because the focus of the highway, then the residents need to start calling their councillors and their MLAs and advocating to the MLAs that highways shouldn't be the priority of the past. The, the future needs to change in regards to what's being uh, paid at the pumps here and what's coming across. So I think that's all part of the transfer payments, municipal grant, whatever you want to refer to it, but it needs to be part of that discussion uh, so we can get better service across the whole municipality for all of our residents. That's, that's everyone's goal in the end of the day. But uh, if the highways is the priority and that's what the province says, well, maybe the residents need to tell their MLAs that that, that model needs to change and we need to have those discussions. And thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Director, I don't see anyone else on the speakers list, so you're free to continue. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the, the last project that we have in the infrastructure section, certainly not the last project for our presentation, but it is associated with the Lewisburg Fortress downtown development. It is a project that was recently at council, um, uh, I believe in February or March, uh, the presentation was, uh, was provided. This is a project that's been applied for. Um, it is uh, associated with a cost share model um, comparable with the ICIP funding, which would be 27% uh, for CBRM and the remaining between the provincial and federal governments. And it's, uh, it's a project that works uh, in, in cooperation with the Fortress of Lewisburg and, uh, uh, and um, um, the provincial government, uh, as well as uh, the downtown uh, area of, of, of Lewisburg. So, um, the the information that I provided um, in your in your package is uh, included uh, as well in a very uh, substantial market analysis report that was created. Uh, Develop Nova Scotia and CBRM are key stakeholders, and they're working together on the plans moving forward. And it's really in anticipation for the bus routing um, with the changes at the Fortress of Lewisburg to make sure that the patrons. Uh, we'll be spending more time in the town, not just driving through. Um, and really the, the funding from CBRM is $64,000 for this particular year, which would be a year of, uh, of um, basically soft costs and detailed design with some construction in, into uh, next year. 
Um, the street traffic accessing the Lewisburg Center and the waterfront area will enter from Main Street via Harbor Front Crescent and exit through either Harbor Front Crescent or Mitchell Street. It's intended to promote waterfront access for both motorists and pedestrians and indicate uh, the importance of the area and encourage motorists to make a turn. Harbor Front Crescent would be widened due to heavier traffic volumes and presence of buses. A sidewalk would be provided on the west side of Harbor Front Crescent so pedestrians would have a continuous corridor from Main Street to the boardwalk. Although Harbor Front Crescent would be signed as the main access, po access point, Mitchell Street would uh, provide a secondary access to the site for passenger vehicles. Um, this widening would require property acquisition and utility pole relocations. And just a point of note, the 64,800 that is included in the budget for this year is funded out of operating reserve from the sale of the former Lewisburg Town Hall. So uh, this would not come out of borrowing for CBRM and it's uh, again conditional on the project being approved uh, through the funding process. If I could, that, that's the infrastructure section and um, the next section is in the wastewater, uh, stormwater um, uh, component. And this is a continuation of an ongoing sanitary sewer inflow and infiltration reduction program. And certainly to some of the points that were mentioned uh, previously, um, we have an annual program designed to improve our knowledge base and condition of our municipal assets. Under this program, work can include asset register building, uh, purchase of asset management software and implementation that's with our asset management processes that are in place now and upgrades to existing underground assets what we're the the focus is to limit the stormwater that is getting into sanitary sewers and we are doing that across cbrm um, what we typically do is a lot 40 450,000 out of the federal gas tax to the project and uh, we have been successful in the last number of years to leverage provincial funding through either the Flood Risk Infrastructure Improvement Fund, FRIP, um, or the PCAP, Provincial Capital Assistance Program Fund. They're small funds uh, and we, we try and leverage those uh, each year, which would then take our, our 450,000 expand on that. It's very important work. Not only does it help with, uh, with um, the availability of, of of flow in our sanitary sewers, but it limits the amount of stormwater getting into our full treatment systems. And that is a is really a domino effect of efficiency, costs, um, and, and effectiveness of our system across the board. Um, so we this is a number, I don't know how I could go back and find out how many years we've been doing this, but we, we have significant seen significant benefits uh, to uh, focusing on this project each year. The next section of projects are in the parks, grounds, buildings, and facilities area of, of projects. Um, typically with our various sports fields across CBRM, we allot 150,000 each year for small capital uh, repairs, uh, improvements, uh, purchases of equipment. That has been an ongoing uh, program. And um, where, if there's cost sharing available, we, we utilize, uh, most times it's, it's small capital that we, we pay entirely. Um, the, uh, the next list of projects are associated with our proposed buildings and general upgrades for 2021. And certainly this is a list that is comprises a number of projects across CBRM buildings and operations. And um, basically we try, uh, we try, we start with a, a much larger list and try and pare it down um, to what we can afford. Uh, I'll go through quickly the list of projects that's provided. And as well, uh, we, we would have Director Bill Murphy online and any of his supporting staff if, if additional questions are required. Um, Wentworth, the first project is actually not a building, but it's Wentworth Park Fountain. Uh, that is a, a piece of uh, infrastructure in our Wentworth Park in Sydney that is needs to be uh, replaced. It was planned to be replaced last year. And I believe due to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, availability of equipment and processes, uh, we, we couldn't um, get that project uh, completed. So it's in, in uh, place for this year. Um, at our city hall, glass replacement this is an ongoing process uh, project. If uh, you stand away from the building and even on the picture that I've provided of city hall, you can see the, the different colors of glass, the, um, the lighter bluish 
um, tinted glass that we call, I believe it's called copper or uh, something like that. It's the newer glass. So um, we are we are still working forward uh, with the replacement of the glass in this building. It will be um, ongoing into the future until we're completed. And um, it's a very significant project because it's not only just glass, it's not for appearance, it's for, um, you know, insulation value and, and, and uh, and there are repairs that happen to the building when we do this as well. Um, so that is the next phase uh, for City Hall. Um, I'm very pleased to have uh, our police headquarters generator included uh, this year. When we were going through our many, my many binders, uh, we had this project identified in 2012. So that's how long that project has been on the list. Uh, our police headquarters has a very small generator, but it's not adequate for the facility. And uh, we have been planning on replacing it for, uh, uh, or upgrading it really. It's not a necessarily a replacement, it's a, it's a full upgrade. Um, and um, in recent years, we've had a few instances of power outages. And uh, it's certainly very important, at least to our police headquarters, that in this day and age for emergency management, that that is, uh, that is a, a, an upgrade that's required. And we'll see when we get to page 33 that we're recommending that that comes out of operational reserve for that, uh, that project. The next line is energy upgrades, $250,000. And as council certainly heard, our, our on-site energy manager that we partner with, with um, Efficiency Nova Scotia, um, Khalid Ibram um, in the last council meeting. The, I know it was a lot of information in a short period of time, but the trajectory and, and the plans over the last five to seven years are very significant. We are now saving substantial operational costs because of the investments into energy upgrades. So we work, um, we work with Efficiency Nova Scotia to our, uh, identify opportunities uh, across all of our up energy upgrades, even to the point of involving uh, the group with our current designs of wastewater treatment plants and other facilities to make sure that we're building the most efficient buildings we can and uh, and retrofitting where available available and we're we're still looking at the low hanging fruit uh, projects that have five years or less of of repayment and in um, very early years a decision was made that we weren't really asking uh, when there was a two year or less repayment for anything we were just doing it and that has uh, provided significant cost savings across CBRM. Uh, the McConnell Library, I know we've uh, talked about libraries uh, over the last number of years. Our current library uh, has a roof issue. It's not the entire roof, uh, but there's certainly requirements. No matter what council's decision go for, going forward with the library is going to be, uh, we need to replace the, the section of roof that's in, uh, in need of repair to design and flat roof repair at the McConnell. We have a similar uh, issue going on at the Lewisburg Seniors uh, facility, roof and exterior upgrades, another $50,000 project. Um, we typically provide uh, $100,000 to fire services associated with their facilities and they're the CBRM owned fire um, and volunteer fire facilities that we have. And um, they are, uh, it's typically $100,000. I do believe uh, the detail on this particular one is work at the Glace Bay Fire Station um, in its entirety, it's one project. We have uh, for the last number of years been upgrading our uh, bus shelters across CBRM as our expansions with transit, uh, transit have, uh, have happened. And um, this is another phase to that $75,000. Um, as well, we have a partnership with with our marketing company that they provide a bus shelter each year. Um, and this is the remaining uh, projects. And uh, Kathy uh, Donovan has put together a, a multi-year plan for replacement of existing bus shelters. They're not uh, really kind of, you know, they're not high-end uh, bus uh, shelter facilities. They're not heated. Uh, we have had some success as with solar panel lighting uh, in them but uh, certainly with the amount of students that we have recently had before the pandemic at the bus, bus stops, the shelters are very important. Um, the last line on, on the sheet or the next line on the sheet is, is associated with the, the, the Lyceum in Sydney. Um, there are some very significant issues going on with that facility. The group has asked uh, for cost sharing. Um, CBRM has provided that um, as I believe that uh, should they receive cost sharing, uh, CBRM would be there with, with some monies. 
it's anticipated. I, I believe the roof and uh, the brick repointing is uh, is the the most immediate concerns for the facility, um, and that uh, project is identified. And as well, uh, there's a total of 1.5 million. But as well below that, uh, I, I did put a note associated with the, the SNL, Sydney and Lewisburg Railway Station in Lewisburg. CBRM still um, has a reserve from the former sale of the, of the Lewisburg Town Hall and 160,000 is there for uh, work uh, that is uh, to be attributed to the town of Lewisburg, our former town of Lewisburg. And uh, the application has been submitted to funding partners with CBRM portion included. Uh, so I, I, if there are any questions on the building sections, I suspect between uh, uh, those on the call and myself, we can try and answer them. Absolutely. There is a speakers list here growing. First, we have Councillor Parsons up. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you to Wayne. Wayne, I noticed that the, in the pre-budget, the police generator wasn't on the list, but uh, I it's on the list today. So I guess my question is knowing that we've been operating since 2012 identified by yourself in terms of providing those services and what are obviously our existing generator backup is working, of course, because we've had, we've had it there for the last nine years without an upgrade. So I'm just wondering, like, in the world of nice to haves, uh, you know, should we not replace as it doesn't work anymore? Or I don't understand they need it. Uh, but if we have something existing that's working, uh, and then, you know, it sounds like wait till it happens, spend the money. And because to take that out of our reserves, that, that for me, that's a question too, in terms of a planned, uh, a planned expenditure. So I guess I'll leave it there and just ask, uh, is it a necessary or is it a nice to have? Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, it's, it's, it's a long story and it's, but it's something I think I can put uh, together very quickly that the original generator that was at the facility uh, was there to cover two things. Uh, one was the, the computer system and the other was the cells um, and some of the backup power in around the, the, the police uh, lockup. Uh, the facility itself is not covered by that, uh, that generator. So when the power, when there are power outages, the majority of the building is, is out of power. Um, the difficulty is that uh, that we have not been able to find that type of money each year for the last number of years. And um, I guess based on some of the operating efficiencies that we've uh, had in place and some of the associated uh, savings in the police budget uh, or other budgets in CBRM for this year, the suggestion was that if we wanted to uh, put it on, we could fund it out of an operational reserve. So uh, it doesn't in in impact borrowing, but I, I certainly, um, you know, uh, sometimes these are very small lines on a page, but there, there's a lot of information in the back channel. So I guess with emergency management and certainly a 24 seven operation, um, we, we don't have every building in CBRM with generators. We have some specific ones, but I think, uh, police headquarters would be high on the, uh, on the list. And Madam Mayor, if I may, I, I just, as, as a council representing the rural area, when you only, you only get so many requests, I also notice in the uh, capital budget that streetlights are not receiving any money in this budget this year as well. And I guess when you get those proverbial questions, we've had five formal requests for a streetlight at a minimal cost uh, to run monthly. And, and we're identifying and taking money out of reserves for necessities, I get that. But in the broader scheme of things, of course, it's hard to justify to those phone calls when when a light is required, but we've got no money for lights and, and, and we're putting money into generators that, uh, you know, for, for emergency services, I, I get that, but I don't truly, truly support it, I guess. I guess talking about street lights, I wanna bring it up now because it's, uh, it's, it's not a topic that's up for discussion as I, as I noted in your, in your uh, presentation. Uh, I, I had the opportunity uh, to, to do an exercise on behalf of my employer actually uh, with NSP uh, where we reviewed our community in terms of the number of streetlights that we have and the relocation of some that were too many in one area and not enough in another area. And, and basically what came back to us was certainly welcome to do that. Uh, I know that you indicated in pre-budget that there were over 17,000 streetlights as, as, as we have an inventory, but I would, I would encourage 
uh, your department to go back and, and work with NSP because I think there's a net savings there in terms of do we need the 17,000? If we don't, are there other areas? I'm sure other councillors are getting requests as well. So when I, when I go through the budget, and I see that you know we're spending a lot of money, a little bit more than you propose on the pre-budget, then I guess in question for me is like, you know, are there other areas that we could potentially save or, and or provide services within the realm of the money we have to work with? So I would encourage uh, that exercise can be undertaken that uh, we, certainly, we certainly do that. Thank you. We certainly will, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on our speakers list, we have Councillor Cyril McDonald. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. Uh, I guess a uh, great segue, Councillor Parsons, as I look at a $150,000 fountain that's going into Wentworth Park, um, I too have a list of streetlights, uh, a list of sidewalks, a list of roads, um, you know, here nor there, I suppose. But uh, Wayne, Director McDonald, I'm just... Uh, $150,000 for a, a park fountain. I'm a runner and I used to go to Wentworth Park quite often and the fountain's never on. Uh, so why are we putting $150,000 into a fountain that, uh, again, we talk about the nice to haves. Uh, we need a generator. That's okay. Do we need a $150,000 fountain? And that's question one. I'll let you answer and then I'll go on. Um. Certainly, Councillor, that's that would be a question to Council. We've we've had uh, approximately four million dollars spent over a number of years, way back in the early two thousands, on Wentworth Park. Uh, the difficulty is what was completed during those projects and what's there today, um, due to a number of reasons, whether it be vandalism, breakdowns, issues. Some things have been removed, as you'll see in many of our parks across the BRM. Uh, in some instances, uh, we have to repair some mechanical systems. Uh, this was planned to be replaced last year. We couldn't, um, I, I believe we couldn't receive uh, the, the actual equipment. And so it, it, got, uh, it didn't get completed. I don't know if Bill Murphy wants to provide uh, any additional information associated with the fountain, but I believe that what, it's not on because it's not working. Okay. Uh, all right. I'll, yeah, I, I, I don't know how my council colleagues feel, but uh, it just seems like a, a large number when, uh, you know, when street lights are a hot commodity and we can't get them, but we can invest 150000 in a fountain that, uh, yeah, uh, most people, I would assume, probably don't even notice. Um, I do have a comment uh, as it relates to our, our previous conversation around the uh, the, um, I'll say, disparity in the funding that we receive from, uh, from our provincial partners. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here reflecting as we move on and I'm processing a lot of information, so a little slow to the, to the, uh, to the punch, I suppose. But I'm just wondering what, uh, and perhaps this is a question for Marie and not for you, Wayne, or maybe it's both of you. Uh, what are we doing to, to lobby our provincial partners to ensure that, uh, that we are actually, you know, we, we recognize we're not receiving our fair share. Uh, I have a pretty good relationship with the folks at the Department of Transportation and like my, uh, my colleague, Councillor Gillespie, uh, the conversations aren't daily, but they're pretty close to it. And I think they also recognize the disparity in funding on a local level. So I'm just wondering from a municipal standpoint, what are we doing? Um, and I, I know that I've heard uh, heard the comment before, what would you like us to do? And Councillor Gillespie uh, speaks to uh, the substantial amount of residential tax revenue that comes from the former county. So I'm just wondering what, what from a municipal level we are actually doing to, uh, to lobby our provincial partners and uh, increase that funding to ensure that our uh, residents of the county are receiving their fair share. Uh, because again, we're coming back to 100 $150,000 fountain uh, that, to be quite frank, I'm a little annoyed to say to say the least that uh, we're investing that kind of money when uh, we have a number of roads that need to be paved, and whether that's county or town, um, it's uh, it's quite frustrating. So, what are we doing to uh, to lobby our provincial partners? So, a couple of things. I, I hope um, the answer isn't nothing. Uh -huh. Now, last couple of years, we've been working hard with the province, um, and that's where the um, 
the study, the viability study came from uh, because we, we've been constantly lobbying, looking for more funding. Um, and so they said, well, let's do the viability study to see if there is a need. We did the viability study. Um, it proved that we, you know, we do require more funding. Um, we did have it on our agenda with the premier the other day, um, but the time was short and we, we could not cover all of those topics. So we did agree that we would get, get together again. That was one of the things on the list. So we certainly need to get back to the table. We, it was kind of left dormant for the, you know, from 2014 to 18 because the province did promise that they would come back to the table, but never have. So I guess that's for all municipalities across the province. But I, you know, we certainly did uh, make efforts through the viability study. We thought that would would help us in our plight to get more funding. Um, hasn't um, hasn't done anything really. Um, the issue really is continuity with ministers and um, political party. It's it's really hard once you get one uh, minister educated, then they're moved out and there's another minister. It seems like we're constantly educating ministers um, to our situation in CBRM. So that's that's kind of, that's difficult. Um, I, I, I agree. We have to, I think, um, push harder than ever. Uh, the increases this year from the province specifically for housing was almost 500,000. We've never had that kind of an increase as long as I've been here. I was shocked at that. Um, where, you know, our, the money coming our way has, it's not even um, increased by the inflation rate. So it's really, really unfair. Um, I would like to comment on the Wentworth Park Fountain. Um, I guess I, I don't see that as, be, when we made the decision on the Wentworth Park Fountain, I guess the decision on any infrastructure, when council makes that decision, which they did years ago, um, it is up to staff to maintain all of those infrastructure items the best we can. So I guess the decision is not that we're putting a fountain in. The decision is the fountain is there and we should maintain it. So um, we do upgrades on all of our infrastructure as best we can. So that would be my comment on that. But you are right. We need to get back with the province and talk about uh, the municipal capacity grant and the money um, for education, corrections, and housing, of those three things, we have no control and we don't influence how they spend that money. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, yes, unfortunately, your time is run. Uh, next, we have Councillor Gillespie. Uh, thank you, Mayor McDougall. Um, may I ask you a question about the generator at the police headquarters? Uh, if we're replacing a generator, uh, would there be an opportunity to utilize the existing generator in another location, or is it just not something that would work anywhere else? Uh, we will. I can, I can answer oh. that. I think it it is a very very small 1990 kind of generator, and it doesn't have really um, any adaptability. Okay. Uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Bill. And the reason I ask is because I know that there are a couple of places uh, looking for uh, generators, uh, you know, small little areas, uh, you know, maybe like, uh, you know, the Spanish River Court or the you know, Wiseman Center uh, that are looking for something small. And if we had something, I think it might be great to try to utilize it somewhere else, if it's applicable, maybe to utilize those areas as warming centers, if that's at all possible. Uh, so I'd hope that you would uh, be looking into that. Um, the Wentworth Park Fountain, may I ask, uh, only because of clarification, since we're, quite a few uh, councillors have been discussing it, is this the splash pad or is this the fountain in, in the actual pond? This is the splash pad. Okay, so this is not the fountain that shoots up and shows all the pretty colors. This is the splash pad itself. No, actually, those all those fountains have been replaced uh, since the original construction uh, okay. due to... Uh, barnacles that have uh, uh, coated them. So they've all been replaced. Uh, this is actually the uh, interactive fountain. Okay, so this is the splash pad, which is actually used by lots and lots of people during winter, uh, summer uh, uh, time frame. And obviously last year with COVID it wasn't. So we're hoping that they'll be able to use it this year. That's correct. Okay. Um, I also have a, a question which I brought up last year, which I will again bring up this year regarding uh, our contribution to uh, increasing the number of bus shelters. 
I just am not in favor of this. I just don't believe that we should be putting money into bus shelters that we then turn over to uh, our marketing uh, company in order to make money on it. Yes, I know we receive a portion of that, but I uh, also understand that other municipalities in Atlanta, Canada, uh, they do not put money into bus shelters. The bus shelter money, uh, bus shelters that are created are created by the marketing firm. I know that they do some, uh, as uh, Director McDonald indicated, uh, but um, of course, you know, I'm going to get on the transit issue where transit doesn't run in, in several of the counties uh, of the districts. And I'm just wondering if that would be additional dollars that we could spend elsewhere as well. The other part of this is when you refer to Lewisburg Seniors roof and exterior upgrades, is, do you mean a seniors complex or is this a gathering area? Uh, I can answer that, Wayne. This is a actually a building that CBRM owns. It came to CBRM uh, at amalgamation by the former town of Bluesburg. Uh, it is actually a social center for seniors. Um, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good. No, I just I wasn't sure if it was actually a senior citizens complex or if it was a, a, a social area. So terrific. Those are my questions. Thank you. If I could, uh, I'd just like to address the bus shelters item. So through our, our contract, uh, I believe it's Pattison, that's, that, that is the company. We have five bus shelters over a five-year program. Um, they replaced three of them initially and the other two, I, I think this may be, they, the five may al already be in um, or the fifth one is coming this year. These are additional to that. I mean, we went for a period of time where you would have a maximum of one or two people at a bus stop or a bus shelter. Now you have dozens of folks and, you know, we can all hope that uh, it's nice sunny weather every time they're there and it's not. Um, so that's, that's really, these are the high traffic bus shelters uh, in locations where, where folks are, are gathering and uh, it's supporting our expanded transit. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, counselor. And thank you, uh, Wayne and and Bill for the clarity there. Uh, we have a pretty extensive speakers list. I do wanna remind you, we do need to stop at 12 uh, for lunch, not only lunch, but there's some work we need to do uh, here in City Hall in terms of COVID information coming through. Um, so if we do not get through the entire speakers list, I will keep note of it uh, and we will reconvene at one o'clock. Uh, next we have Councilor Peru. Oh, so I got three minutes. Are we sticking? Are we sticking to your? Okay. Uh, I don't want to. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't want to beat a dead horse, Wayne. But uh, just for a little bit of clarity here, where it says Wentworth Park Fountain, and then as we start talking about the fountain, you're calling it a splash pad. So we're classifying those as two different, or the same thing. For one, and uh, where yeah, that may be my fault. Sorry about that. Um, the it's, it's as uh, Director Murphy identified, it's the splash pad. It was referred to as a fountain in the project last year. Right, and so in last year's budget, were you uh, allotted the 150,000 for us? What, what ended up happening with that money last year where you didn't get the parts? Was that classified as wiggle room for something else or is that money still, still allotted? It wasn't spent and it wasn't borrowed. Okay, so exactly what what is it that has to be done there sorry i know we, you guys just talked about it but i'm just trying to wrap my head around one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a fountain i can get fifty thousand dollars to fix a library and roofs but i'm just trying to see where where that money's going what it what it's for um we again maybe i, I don't know i'm not sure if alan clark's on the line he's technically oriented here but for the most part uh, what's involved is actually pulling out all of the original infrastructure that has failed. There's been some council, some dramatic leaks uh, in the original construction uh, due to subsidence. So the intention of the of the uh, requested funds is to is to pull all of that infrastructure up, put in a new ap apparatus, and then re uh, redo all of the original uh, paving and uh, and concrete. Okay. All right. I'll, uh, that's good enough for now, I guess. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perouche. 
Uh, next, we have Councillor Eldon McDonald. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. And I guess I'll go with the topic of the day with the fountain at Wentworth Park. Um, it is actually a, a fountain that was put in with the redevelopment to Wentworth Park when we did the three ponds uh, and very much is used as a splash pad. Uh, it's used regularly. Uh, you'll see kids playing in it pretty well constantly as long as the heat is there in the summer. Uh, I do get concerns when it isn't working and why it's not working as I do with the fountains that are in the ponds. Uh, we talk about making uh, our community a vibrant community. Uh, the ones in the ponds are, are more of a decorative fashion, I get that, but it shows to the health and vibrancy of a, of a community uh, and uh, no different than we look at the lighting that's on, on City Hall recently. Uh, it's all about trying to make our, our community more vibrant and attractive. Uh, the splash pad itself, to me, uh, $150,000, uh, I would agree 100% with CAO Marie Walsh. Uh, if we're not going to, to maintain and upgrade our infrastructure as we install it, uh, then I would suggest if the splash pad in Wentworth Park doesn't get fixed, that we put a moratorium on any splash pads or any contribution that Seabrim would make towards that. And we just talked about uh, the Hawks Field having a splash pad put in. So if we're going to be rethinking how much it costs to put infrastructure in to supply splash pads for the community, uh, we, we need to have that discussion now if we're going to move forward in the future with having any of these types of amenities. Uh, they're going to cost 300000 in another 10 or 15 years when, you know, I'm hoping that will stay in the budget. If it stays in the budget, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, it needs to be replaced again. Uh, it's probably going to be $250,000. It's the price of doing business. It's the price of, of infrastructure. Uh, it's never going to get cheaper. It's always going to continue to raise in price. Uh, but anybody that goes by that that area will notice in the summertime that it's highly used by the kids uh, in that park uh, all the time. Um, the police generator, I think it's it's a necessity. It's it's something that's been, as, as Wayne, I think, indicated, you're looking at 10 years uh, waiting and waiting for it. Um, with all due respect to Councillor Parsons' comments, I get where, where we're looking at it. It already has a parcel generator or parcel power, uh, you know, our policing and our EMO services of today are a whole lot different than they were years ago. Uh, and to, to wait till something happens and then not have the generator when we really need it, when, when the generator has gone and something happens, um, I don't think that's a good way for us to, to, to look at the future. I think we have to prepare and be ready uh, to roll when the power goes, as opposed to waiting until the infrastructure that we have in place doesn't work and then we have a power outage and we can't function at all. So uh, I would be in support of, of keeping that infrastructure uh, or upgrading that infrastructure. Um, and just through uh, you, Madam Mayor, to Wayne. Um, Wayne, I'm just wondering, uh, McConnell Library and the Lyceum are in here. Uh, myself and the mayor had a tour of the Lyceum. I've, I'm quite familiar with the building, but uh, it is very much in deplorable shape. So I'm very pleased to see that the money is there. Uh, but I believe that's for, I think, a roof replacement uh, and is desperately needed. Um, and the McConnell Library Center 200 slash buildings for uh, green upgrades. The day of the library, uh, special meeting in the library, uh, there was a motion passed in the morning in regards to uh, this new uh, green fund that the federal government was looking to put in place. And those three priorities were moved forward uh, that morning. I'm just wondering where this all sits, the McConnell Library, the Center 200, where does all sit in regards to that particular motion? Uh, of that morning. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, good question. On the next slide, when we get to it, we'll be talking about a more immediate Center 200 piece. Um, but what we uh, have gotten direction, certainly from CBRM, from Grub Council, is to apply to the fund that's currently out now. The fund, uh, we're getting our applications ready. And when I go through the various five year sheets, uh, I talk about when those projects will start to flow money-wise. We'll have them applied for. Um, and I guess when we get acknowledgement or authorization that they are going to go forward, uh, we'll, we'll fit them in. And I, I did what we could put together with a best guess as to when they'll flow money-wise. They're pretty substantial if you add a significant library project and an expansion at Center 200, as well as some of the small projects that... Uh, that uh, will be going into that fund, but um, it's uh, it's more of a cash flow time frame, so they wouldn't be in for immediate. We don't know anything about uh, approvals. What I try and limit current budgets to are things that are guaranteed in here. Otherwise, you end up uh, 
basically place holding money. And uh, we wouldn't want to do that and miss out on opportunities for this particular year. Yeah, so I guess I'm just wondering when you when you when you reference, you know, um, applications are getting ready to put applications in. So and it's your time, counselor. Up. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm trying to keep it everyone. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Great. Thank Madam you. Mayor, if I could explain just quickly on the library roof, that is basically an immediate repair that needs to happen to keep the facility operating. No matter what council uh, puts forward with a library upgrade, it's going to be a number of years before uh, the current McConnell Library would be either closed or whatever happens. So I, I would say that um, that uh, the fifty thousand is is to deal with immediate issue, and the larger capital will come in in further discussion. Just if I could, Mayor, just for the clarity, I, I mentioned the Lyceum. So Wayne, the Lyceum one is a is a replacement, though, correct? For the roof. That's a roof project. Uh, however, there's, uh, I guess, uh, it's, there's an ask that the group is putting forward. Marie may have more information on that. So yeah, the Lyceum group, they are currently working on a project for um, a Nova Scotia Music Museum. And in order to, um, they're looking to have the roof replaced because the integrity of the building is really being threatened with the roof. It's, it's not in good shape at all. Um, so they are looking for leveraged funding. Um, so our share of that would be a third. So we, they are um, at, trying to access other funds, but really the roof is in very poor shape at the Lyceum, which we own. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And thank you for the clarity as well, <clears throat> Lane and Marie. Uh, next, we have Councillor Ken Tracy. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, to you, uh, Wayne, uh, the upgrades uh, of the uh, of our buildings. Um, I'm just wondering if maybe uh, Director Murphy can answer this. Uh, the South Street uh, building at the South Street ballpark. Uh, it looks to me like uh, maybe the roof uh, needs to be. Uh, we need to have some repairs done on that, and I'm just wondering if. Uh, if Bill can maybe elaborate on that, if he's he's aware of it, I'm sure him and Alan are. Just uh, if they could just uh, give me a little bit of an update. Sure, Councillor, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, that repairs that are minor like that would actually probably coordinated through our uh, buildings uh, buildings division. So uh, obviously we have a, a group of workers and carpenters and so on. So repairs like that normally are done through our operating budget, not as a capital. Thanks, uh, thanks, Bill. And also, I just want to touch briefly on the uh, on the splash pad. Uh, I can tell you this: that uh, having uh, having a, a splash pad at our park the last three or four years, it's it's been amazing the amount of traffic flow that goes through there, and uh, it brings certainly brings uh, joy to your heart when you see kids that don't have the ability to get to uh, get to you know, like Meyer Park or South South Big Lace Bay Beach or whatever that they're within walking distance of, of, of a splash pad. And I'm sure Sydney is the same. So for me, it's, it's a major big time asset. And uh, yeah, I, I certainly support the, the 150,000 to uh, for upgrades in this uh, on the splash pad. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Next, we have Councillor James Edwards. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. Uh, I just got a, uh, a comment and I have another uh, comment, I guess, sort of an asterisk on it uh, um, uh, through you, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, to uh, uh, Director McDonald, please. Uh, that that um, uh, line item there, well, it's not a line item, but the, the uh, pertaining to the SNL railway station, um, a small point uh, perhaps, but uh, uh, my understanding is it was uh, 170,000 as opposed to the uh, 160. Uh, and the other uh, point uh, I'd like to uh, make, and uh, I know it, this is uh, our buildings type of thing, but the other uh, comment uh, would be with uh, relative to the uh, Port Morion uh, Fire Department. Uh, uh, perhaps that's going to be addressed in another uh, area. So I'll ask you to uh, comment on both if you would please, uh, Wayne. 
Um, yeah, so the SNL Railway, I'll, I'll certainly check with our, uh, our finance folks. Uh, they may know specifically the number may be wrong, but whatever is uh, we have uh, associated with the sale of the former town hall, we have it included as part of the project for the Lewisburg Fortress Develop Nova Scotia project and the SNL Railway Museum or Railway Station uh, in Lewisburg. So um, I'll, I'll clarify uh, the actual number. Um, about the Port Morian Fire Hall, uh, I did have some information um, a number of years ago that uh, that we I, I ended up getting the reports that I guess were prepared in 2017. So we're still looking at that. the 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 structure is very old. Uh, I don't know if that's one of the facilities that's considered uh, the CB, uh, a CBRM owned fire hall, but um, I believe there's a bigger uh, plan in place. I'm not sure if uh, if if Chief Seth um, may be able to provide some information or our CAO um, um, as to the go forward plan with that. Well, similar uh, situation uh, though. The uh, even if they broke ground on a, on a new uh, facility today, uh, we're still looking at a year, uh, two years down the road before it's uh, available. So. Uh, perhaps there's uh, some funding might, that might be required uh, to uh, um, uh, get the uh, uh, firehouse uh, um, serviceable for the next uh, uh, year or so, but I'll, I'll wait for um, CAO to perhaps uh, comment on that, please. So Chief Seth is um, actually out working on COVID issues, um, but we, um, we have a meeting coming up with um, several of the fire departments in that area. So we are looking at it. We are working with the province. Um, we're trying to find a solution. We just do not have one as of yet, but we'll certainly keep you updated. Yeah, so, but, but uh, for, for my point though, uh, that that's the asterisk uh, that portion that I was uh, speaking of though. So uh, uh, this isn't uh, new news. So if, uh, or, or when that uh, facility is uh, uh, addressed, uh, there will be some uh, money available for that uh, as well? That would come back to council for their approval. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Deputy Mayor Erlene McMullen. Um, Madam Mayor, I just had a couple comments and in the in the view of time, I'm sure I can find a way to pull them out later so you can pass me. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you, Deputy. Um, next, we, we have about three minutes left. Um, so what I might do actually is we're going to put our, our meeting on hold here. This has been a really full morning. We have a lot more to get through, but um, we will start again at 1 p.m., uh, Deputy Mayor, I can put you first on the list then if you'd like. No, Madam Mayor, that's fine. A lot of it was already addressed and I, 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 there's other places I can bring it up later. So I'm good, thanks. Excellent. Okay, so we will start with Councillor Darren O'Quinn, Councillor Lauren Green and Councillor Cyril McDonald to follow. Um, again, good job, everyone. This is healthy conversation being had um, about our budget for the upcoming year. Um, we 